Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many faces, so many new faces from different places for the one I, I know. Uh, happy to, 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 I, I don't know if it's because of yours that uh, the Make It Talk are, are moving ahead and getting more and more attractive and more and more people, but that's, that's really a, a, a great news. Maybe just a very few words to, for those, very, very few, for those who, who do not know necessarily Make It, who do not know what the talks of Make It are about, and then we will engage in what we are dealing with today. Um, my name is Patrick Caron. I'm the director of the Make It. Make It means Montpellier Advanced Knowledge Institutes on Transitions. And it's part of what we call the Institute for Advanced Studies. There are more or less 100 in the world. Uh, we substituted, and that's not just by chance, the word studies by the word knowledge. So it's not an institute of advanced studies, but an institute of advanced knowledge, re acknowledging different sources of knowledge and not just the academic source. And, uh, and this was created in 2019 within the University of Montpellier, funded by, uh, by the program MUSE and with the basic assumption that understanding why we don't agree, why we disagree to each other, uh, and uh, looking at a mediation process, intellectual mediation process, could help us moving towards transition, to help uh, moving, uh, addressing the obstacles for transitions. Of course, as we are funded by MUSE and the university, it's about fit, protect and care. That means the, the connected uh, challenges of agriculture, food, environment and and health. And, and then as all Institute of Advanced Studies or Advanced Knowledge, the, the, the basic modus operandi is to invite colleagues from all over the world through different types of calls to come to Montpellier and to benefit from a free space to think, to think, to review the world, to refresh the world, to think out of the box, to have the uh, quietness to do things that the daily life of an academic does not allow to do. So this is what we, what make it is about. But by doing so, we right from the beginning, because one of the roots of make it was, uh, well, the density in Montpellier, the academic density in Montpellier is so strong so dense that it's very difficult to connect for someone who comes from another country to understand who is who, what's happening, where, when, how to connect, who to talk to, how to look at the different uh, persons. So uh, make it at make it we wanted to uh, stay to, to move out of a bubble, not to stay in a bubble. So to stimulate contact with. Uh, with stakeholders, non-academic stakeholders, but also and mainly within the, the the community. That means for the hosted scientists to connect with the academic Montpellier community, to interact with it, uh, to also have uh, interaction with students and the, the 70,000 students that are, are, are in Montpellier and to try to, as far as possible, to 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 put in place bridges. And so uh, this is exactly the reason why we created the talks. And talks are, uh, are organized from time to time. Uh, we have regular seminar within Make It, uh, and some of the hosted scientists are, are here. So every Thursday morning, we are working together, but we want to organize as well discussion out of this group and uh, with uh, academic, non-academic uh, stakeholders and including uh, uh, students who are here for their studies. So uh, we put emphasis this time on education. 
Uh, one of the, if I, if I say, if I look at the T of make it transitions is because somehow I make it short. We are not happy with our world and we are not happy with the, the destination our world is going to. We want to change something. And, uh, there is no stronger engine and no stronger driver than young people to change the world. And, and this is, uh, mm. this is, uh, absolutely obvious. First of all, I don't know if it's the Greta blah, 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 uh, symptom, but, uh, we can see for the last five, six, seven years, quite a, a, a huge movement of young all over the planet to change the world and to engage in, in thinking differently, um, because of the energy, because also of the future. Um, I, I probably have a, a, a much shorter future than, uh, than the young people. Well, for all those reasons, uh, we consider that the drivers are, are with young people and, and to make that work, we probably not only have to change the world, uh, building on the energy, but also to, to change the way they are educated. And this is what we are talking about today. Changing the education, uh, changing the education because it's uh, one of the 17 SDGs, not only for that, we believe in that. One of the 17 SDGs, the number four, with one uh, uh, particular uh, target 4.7, which is about uh, uh, educating for sustainable development. And, uh, and uh, what we wanted to have a discussion about that. How do we have to change the education to make it happen? And uh, the best way to uh, begin the, the discussion was to ask students here in Montpellier to share their views about that. So we had a, a, a first uh, brainstorming session and, and they will uh, just come and, and, and present what the outcome, what's the first idea, uh, uh, about, uh, about their ideas, about their wishes, about their dreams, about what they feel difficult. I don't know. They, they will speak freely to us. And then we have here three, uh, experts and, and we will engage in education and we will engage the, 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 we will engage the, the discussion with them and then with the, the whole room, of course. But then, and uh, my role is finishing here. I will keep quiet. I will just introduce uh, Hajar Shukrani. Uh, she is at UMRGO uh, here. She's from Morocco. She's from the Institute of, well, you have the, you have here the presentation. She's on the left hand side and she uh, is uh, doing a, a PhD here in Montpellier with uh, colleagues at uh, UMRGO um, for water management uh, area, then um, in, I'm, I'm sorry if, I, I know I can say Kim, but uh, Young, Young, okay, <laughs> uh, who is a PhD student in uh, education science at, at Cliodef, and here as well uh, as Montpellier from Korea, and then uh, Anaël uh, Dufour, who is an ecologist, who is marine ecologist, who is ma uh, making a PhD at Marbeck, which is another UMR. So they have dis began discussing across them uh, two weeks ago, and uh, they have the floor to to stimulate us and to boost us and to engage in conversation. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, thank you to all of you for accepting to uh, attend this event. Uh, I am really happy to be here with you. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, I have a disclaimer. So English is my third language. I might use some words a thousand times or uh, do some mistakes. Excuse me for that. Uh, as Patrick said, I am doing my PhD in Montpellier, but I am also doing it in uh, Morocco, in Rabat. So I am doing a co tutel uh, thesis, uh, which means I am supervised uh, by uh, professors in Morocco as well as in Montpellier. 
And uh, for me, this event uh, is, I volunteered for, for this event because for me, it starts from a personal thing. Education, I think, concerns all of us. All of you were students one day or are students one day. But after that, you are CEOs of companies, uh, um, uh, presidents of programs, etc. And uh, the fact that I am being able to uh, do my studies in Morocco and in French gives me a slight idea about the pros and cons of each education system. And the Moroccan education system is really inspired from the French system. And also being a PhD student means that uh, we can, we travel a lot. We meet different people with uh, coming from different education systems and backgrounds. And one thing I uh, concluded is that education is really fundamental in shaping our profiles and our personalities, uh, which is uh, which is uh, something uh, important. And uh, one of the pillars we uh, discussed uh, two weeks ago with uh, my colleagues was reinventing learning practices. And uh, I'm just going to use the word learning and education interchangeably. I know there are nuances, but just for the sake of simplicity, because I didn't know uh, like uh, the, the quality of the audience. So I'm going to be uh, a little bit uh, general. OK, why do we need uh, learning practices or how can we reinvent them today or nowadays? We need innovation, right? And in order to be innovative, we have to create or to uh, make up uh, students who are creative, some students who can uh, make up uh, bright and novel ideas. Why? Because nowadays also we leave uh, some challenges. There was a pandemic, there is a climate crisis, there is a mental health crisis. There are a lot of crises. And in order to adapt to these crises, in order to recover for them, we have to inculcate uh, the resilience. We have to uh, uh, help students uh, to know how to be resilient face-to-face uh, -to, -face to these challenges, as well as critical thinking. Today, it's not really important how much content we remember or memorize. So it's really not important if we download information in the heads of the students and then ask them to regurgitate it back up on exams. It's really not important because now a day is more than ever. We have access to a lot of platforms. We have a lot of information. The problem is we have fake information and true and credible information. How can we distinguish between a fake one and a good one? And uh, how can we do that? Simply by developing a critical thinking or a critical mind. OK, this is much important than really learning and absorbing content. And responsibility is also uh, one of the principles uh, we uh, we can have uh, in education. Why? Because we have to stop blaming students. We have to stop blaming teachers, professors. I think everyone is responsible for that. At least if you have a problem, the least thing you can do is to speak up. You say, I have this problem. We have to communicate. I, and I think we really like uh, communication. Although we talk about communication and stuff, but I think the work has to be done on a behavior, uh, behavioral level. Okay. So this is the, the principles of education and uh, in order to reinvent learning practices. And um, today, I don't think we are going to give you uh, a universal recipe. There is not only one uh, manner to do things. We can you uh, we can do that dependent on the context. Like for example, uh, in your class, I think you may have refugees. You may have some people with ADHD, which is attention attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. You can have uh, students with trauma. You can have uh, also students with different skills and knowledge, and you can't treat them the same way we are different and uh, uh so this is uh this is like uh, some of the ingredients i gave you and uh, i'm gonna quote a person last week i was in a workshop and someone said uh, a quote that i really liked there is not a universal recipe but there are common ingredients okay we don't have to cook something uh, the same thing but we can use different ingredients in order to reinvent these learning practicals through creativity uh, resilience, critical thinking, and uh, be responsible. Okay, now that we answered like the why questions, how are we going to do it? How are we going to implement that? I think that uh, in our education system, uh, we always propose solutions, but uh, generally they do not work. 
And if we propose solutions and they don't work, that means we still ignore the problem. So first of all, uh, we have to do a diagnosis. Okay, let's involve all the uh, all the actors that are directly or indirectly collect, connected to the education system, like students, parents, professors, supervisors, CEOs of, uh, of companies uh, like uh, uh, startups and everyone, and ask them, uh, where is the problem? Okay, what's for you the problem? A problem for students might not be a problem for the professor. Okay, we have to create uh, local group discussions in order to, first of all, uh, identify the problem. That's the first thing to do. The second thing to do is that, uh, like professors are at the front, uh, at, at the front scene, and maybe they are the first people, uh, to be blamed. But I think we have to, um, to look backwards and see that these professors are not trained or, uh, uh, are not having psychological behavioral training. That's why they cannot communicate. Okay. Uh, the professor is here, uh, c comes to give a course, but it's not necessarily he understands why this person is not focused, why this person is having a problem, why this person is brilliant, but can't make it on exams. Okay. That's why it's really important, uh, in the training, uh, training of trainees model. We have to include empathy and empathy. I think it's the key word in, uh, in this pillar. Uh, why? Because empathy, it's the fact that, uh, you understand the other person and you make them feel that they are understood. And this is creates a bond of trust. And if you create trust and communication, then we can collaborate together. And I think empathy is not something uh, like exclusive to professors, but I think also to students, uh, every every stakeholder. OK, so maybe we can think of something like a collective empathy. How can we develop that? And uh, of course, uh, being uh, being face to face to different peoples, that means we do not have the same uh, cognitive capacities. We do not have the same uh, skills. We do not have the same uh, uh, political background, cultural background, religious background, uh, gender, etc. That means I may uh, I may find a way to understand and to learn a uh, thing, but it might be it might not fit uh, uh, like uh, Thora or Marianne or someone else. Okay, I think in the classroom we um, we uh, it's important to give choices to the students. Okay, if for example I am interested in. Uh, in podcasts, why can I not learn about a subject here in podcasts? If someone likes to uh, to draw, well, how can we use art in science? Okay, there are different manners to learn and to understand. Because I think uh, learning does not happen in classroom and textbooks. It's really it goes beyond that. Okay, uh, being active in projects, in associations, organization, etc. And uh, that's why we need immersive learning and. Um, Okay, uh, if we change all of that, there is something important and uh, like a pillar, which is our mindset and narratives. Because I think now uh, the world is really pessimistic a little bit. We talk about problem crisis as we as we are going to die tomorrow. But it's really important to take these problems as challenges. Okay, because if you see it as a problem, it's an obstacle, it's a barrier. And in psychology, there is a phenomena called uh, analysis paralysis. And we can't do anything about it. But, but if you perceive it as a challenge, uh, it gives you a boost to go out from your comfort zone. And then you start thinking about solution and, uh, it gives hope. Okay. This is important because if we don't change our mindsets, I'm sure that our actions will not align, uh, with what we want. And of course, we need to ensure the continuity of uh, this learning methods and practices uh, with the inauguration of uh, official initiatives. Why? Because I think each five years or each elections uh, comes the minister with his team and they change something about education. I don't know, like they change uh, pants or uh, dresses. And no, it's not. It's really something serious. Education and health are serious problems. OK, and we need continuity because we cannot be angry and grateful because I think there are some really good stuff to keep up from the old education system, but it's really good to capitalize on that and add something new because generation changes, challenges changes, and it's really important to maintain uh, a solid uh, base. 
That's why we need uh, these uh, official initiatives to mentor and to maintain the education system, because I think there are always going to be challenges. It's not going to stop, but it's really important uh, that we can monitor and each time maintain the education system. And uh, that was all about uh, learning practices. Uh, it's not uh, my work, only my work. It's the work I, we did uh, in the brainstorming with Anayel Hyongyang and Nick, who I thank. He's not here due to work occupation, and I thank him for that. Thank you. And now I give the floor to Hyongyang. Hello. Hello, everyone. So my name is Hyang Yang Kim, and I'm a PhD candidate in education. My, my research topic is to analyze motivational factors of food choice uh, to promote health and food education. So I participated in this brainstorming se uh, session with my other colleagues because I was just being curious about other points of view on the importance of education especially in ecological transition and sustainable development. So why education is important for me? I major in education, so it's quite obvious that I think education is important. But especially when it comes to ecological transition and sustainable development, I think education gets more important. Let me explain. To change people's behavior so that uh, it contributes to sustainable developments, there might be some other ways to do it. We can oblige or prohibit, or more tactfully, we can nudge people. But what we need to do is not only to change behaviors, but to change minds. By means of education, I mean, to transform individuals and to transform society, to realize ecological transition. Yet, it's a lot of work, it might take a long time, but it's a sure and ethical way to realize transition in the long run. So what should we do? I think, we think we need to promote sustainable development-oriented curriculum. For ecological transition, we need framework transition. Curricula is an educational framework defining objective, contents, and strategies of education. We can promote a sustainable development-oriented curricula by reorganizing its structure, by putting uh, sustainable development in the center of curricula. Reorganizing doesn't mean just adding something new. One of the practical problems that we might be faced with is that when we propose something new to people who have already a lot of things to do, they are hardly responsive and it often depends on the willingness to take part in. If we think transition, if we think transition is necessary and if we want people to be more implicated, we should do it in a more effective way in, uh, in a more effective way and offer a facilitating environment. <laughs> then how can we do this? First, we need to define collectively the objectives of curricula for ecological transition and sustainable development in a local context and to share these goals with all members. We should be able to reach a consensus of object on objectives through dialogue with all members as far as possible. It's also a principle of democracy. Through this dialogue, members make their decisions on what they pursue. This can involve and motivate them to participate as they feel more concerned. Discussing and refining, uh, redefining in a local context is necessary. It makes projects more feasible. So I propose at the university level to make orientation meeting, which is held in general at the beginning of the semester. 
as a place or an opportunity to discuss transition and sustainable development in order to define collectively the sustainable development objectives of curricula. Second, we need to reschedule schedules to make curricula more flexible because education also happens beyond classroom. Learning activities should be organized not only in formal education, but also through informal and non-formal education. So we need curricula which are adapted to each individual and open to civil society so that it evolves in line with rapid social and environmental changes. In these uh, flexible curricula, students should have possibility to do activities in civil society, for instance, association or volunteer activities or advocacy activities in parts of their curriculum, depending on their personal or professional interests. And students uh, should also uh, pos have possibility to do activities in touch with nature in order to develop their sensibility uh, to environment. Third, we need a system that can validate this, uh, these extra institutional activities through a portfolio of skills, competences, and attitude that students attained through their activities. Because we should be able to educate people who can act for their community as well as for our planet. So I propose at university level to validate this portfolio as part of credits. Finally, we need to address uh, sustainability issues immediately because a young generation is getting eco-anxious. We are affected psychologically by what's going on this planet and what's going to happen in the future on this planet. According to a study that was conducted in 10 countries around the world, including France, 45% of young people responded that they are, they regard themselves as eco-anxious. One way to cope with this feeling of apprehension or this feeling of powerlessness is to take action, take really concrete actions. We need to enable young people to think themselves about a new future, a possible future, and to come up with solutions so that they feel more empowered. So listening to students' ideas is one step and taking it into account for curricula implementation is a further step. I hope that we can reach this further step. Thank you for listening to me and listening to our ideas. Thank you. Hello, hi everyone. So I'm the last uh, PhD student, so I will try to complete the, the common view we have on education uh, coming from the brainstorm we did with my two other colleagues. So my name is Anaëlle. I just started my PhD a few months ago uh, in Marbeck, um, lab and I'm doing marine ecology and I'm studying the role of great vertebrates so fish marine mammals in the nutrients and carbon cycles. Uh, I feel deeply concerned about uh, the global social environmental uh, crisis and I recognize education as a major leverage point to actually make the transitions we need. And moreover, as a PhD student, I feel at a key step of my life because I'm still uh, being a learner, but I'm also becoming an educator. And so I question myself on the best ways to learn and to educate to trigger uh, the actions we need to implement to have a better world. Uh, so my main point is about how transdisciplinarity is necessary to find our place in our very complex world. So as you know, today's issues and big challenges are interlinked with uh, common causes, with synergic um, consequences and feedback loops between all of uh, the crises that we know. 
In this context, um, it requires to learn on a problem-based approach and educate students to search in multiple disciplines to solve an issue or a problem. So here in Montpellier University, some teaching units already use the problem-based approach through group projects. However, they are still involving a very limited of, uh, number of disciplines. For example, I remember in my master's degree doing research projects involving different fields of biology and ecology, but not more than that. So making a step further would require to actually mix disciplines, including sciences and social sciences. So this type of project could be co-built by educators from sciences and social sciences to integrate the scientific and societal ins and outs of a given problematic. And this process, bridges should be made between the different faculties and universities we have here in Montpellier. So for example, the science faculty, uh, the education faculty, the law faculty, the University of Paul Valéry on letters and humanities. And so researchers and educators could, could co-build uh, the, the curricula together. For example, I know that in Paul Valéry University, um, they developed a master called Environmental Humanities, which is a subsection of uh, the anthropology master. And uh, they are trying to integrate classes of science uh, with actual environmental scientists. And so I think we should push uh, for this type of initiatives. My second main point is uh, going uh, beyond transdisciplinarity to reach what I call transculturality. So beyond transdisciplinarity, it is very important for learners uh, to be encouraged to develop their critical thinking. Aja already uh, talked a little bit about this and it is uh, really a key point. So to do this, uh, the education system should be more open to alternative systems of values and knowledge uh, that exist in other societies. So indeed, we are trained uh, to think in our modern Western perspective, uh, which have a specific system of values and knowledge. However, other people on the planet have completely different ways of thinking, of living, of ma making knowledge. And so we should understand them and consider them worthy in order to be able to tackle uh, the global challenges in a fair and equitable way. In the French university system, historians and soci sociologists can also bring a new light on how our own uh, system of values and knowledge is built. For example, this will allow to be more reflexive on uh, the place of techniques and technologies in our society, or for example, deconstruct big ideas like the neutrality of science. And therefore, all students should benefit from this type of teaching, including uh, people from science and social sciences. So we could implement easily uh, this type of classes in Montpellier, where we already have philosopher, historian of sciences, anthropologic, ant anthropologist, etc., already on our campuses. Uh, so right now, we could implement mandatory classes on this subject to all students in scientific and social sciences, bachelors and masters. Uh, for example, the students studying environmental sciences, uh, I think it's very essential to learn about uh, autochtone and local communities, uh, knowledge and values, uh, and recognize that, for example, their, their values use and their way of living is a key point to conserve biodiversity. This is just an example that how we can implement this. And to finish, my last point is uh, about breaking barriers between intellectual and practical knowledge. So adding more practical skills in academic tracks would empower learners to take, take actions by having both a theoretical framework of knowledge, but also concrete skills to act. Breaking this distinction would require to entirely design the secondary and um, higher education system. But in a first step, we can initiate that now by including educators from various backgrounds, including workers, to share their practical skills and knowledge. Even though the distinction between professional and research master do no longer exist, the reality is that students aiming at research careers are completely disconnected from other fields of work. Indeed, students and, 
and young researchers working at the interface between science and society are often penalized because they are not focused in one discipline. Uh, so here in Montpellier University, we could encourage, for example, internships at the interface, interface between academia and other parts of the society. For example, uh, the science policy interface, science education, science media interface, etc. And we could also promote research action projects that is really grounded at the same time in science and society. So yeah, I finished with uh, this point. Thank you very much. Uh, actively uh, the answer positively to our invitation without knowing what make it work actually uh, they have participated in this brainstorming session they have worked extra hours in addition of the usual uh, classes and commitments uh, to make this very uh, innovative and uh, uh, proposals and I think uh, that will give us a lot of food for thought for, for our discussion. So thanks again, Aja, Yong Yong, and Anna for that. So my name is uh, Marianne Chomel and I'm a Make It Project Manager and I have the honor today to moderate uh, this panel of uh, eminent education experts. So what I propose is that to digest what we just heard, I will present the panel and ask the first reaction, and then uh, you will be able to, to ask a question to what you, you, you have heard. Um, so I will, I will start with the people in the room who are all based in Montpellier, but uh, with very different uh, approaches on, on the topic of uh, today's talk. Um, Valérie. Valérie Borel, uh, you are the coordinator of the master's degree environmental management at the University of Montpellier, in which students get uh, acquainted with the uh, SDGs uh, and have the possibility also to test very innovative practices. So I hope you will be able to mention some of them. Uh, you also coordinated the European uh, Erasmus Plus project uh, called MAREMA. Uh, that created a common master's program in five African uh, universities. Uh, and the idea was to uh, answer water and climate challenges, if I understood well, in African metropolis. Uh, you are at the moment developing follow up activities on project that you may want to do and you will go center on the um, and you're also involved in new initiatives with the University of Montpellier related to CharmEU, which lead me to, to Gilles, uh, to present Gilles Sibra, who is the director of the doctoral college uh, here at the University uh, of Montpellier. Uh, Gilles, you are a chemist. Uh, attached to, oh, yes. <laughs> to the Institute of Biomolecular Maximus, BMM. Um, you are also responsible of the Montpellier uh, antenna of the European project called Charm EU, which includes a research and innovation component, a business <laughs> and society one, as well as a training one with its own master's degree uh, in global challenges for sustainability. So really uh, relevant for our team today. And you will be also able to tell us a bit more about uh, uh, this project and another one called EDIL, uh, which stands for Interdisciplinary and In Lab Graduate Program, which is a new graduate program of the University of, of Montpellier. And Lian Cove, um, you are an agronomist. You have worked uh, in Africa and Asia for the past uh, 15 years. Uh, trying to build capacity of small of the farmers uh, on climate issues and agroecology uh, through a crop construction uh, approach, which is also very interesting for, for the discussion we just had with the, with the students. Uh, you are here to present the One Planet uh, Fellowship Program that you coordinate at Agropolis uh, uh, Foundation. A program that relies on strong cooperation between African and European researchers uh, in order to enhance the capacities of high potential young researchers in relation to agriculture and climate change. So, uh, challenges, uh, and we are talking about transition, we are, we are in the heart of, of the topic. Uh, 
Uh, online, uh, we are lucky enough to have uh, Deborah Nouri, who is uh, also uh, at the University of Montpellier, but who couldn't be uh, here with us today. So we are really happy to have her, her online. Uh, Deborah is a lecturer and researcher in complex and nonlinear uh, dynamics of learning. And she's also a member of Edgar Morin's book, uh, Brilliance in Complexity. So Edgar Morin is also a very important figure for us in, in Make It. Uh, uh, and, and this complexity and controversy approach is, is something we are trying to nurture uh, in our institute. Um, so I think Deborah will come back on this notion of uh, reliance, reliance uh, uh, that will echo uh, this question of empathy and uh, emotion uh, that are also really important. And last but, but not least, uh, we are really honored to have with us uh, Paul Walsh, who will be our international uh, panelist for, for today. Um, Paul, you come originally from the University College Dublin in Ireland, where you are a full professor of international development studies and the director uh, of the Center for Sustainable Development Studies uh, there. But you are uh, currently on segment to the Sustainable Development Solution Network, SDSN, uh, as its vice president of education. So for those who, of you who don't know SDSN, uh, SDSN was launched in 2012 by Jeffrey Sachs, uh, its current president, under the auspices of the United Nations Secretary uh, General. And the network promotes uh, approaches to implement the SDGs and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change through uh, education, research, uh, policy analysis, etc. So, Paul, uh, I hope you will be able to present some of uh, the initiative uh, of SDSN in relation to today's Make It Talk, uh, and notably the SDG Academy that you are uh, directing, which is a really interesting initiative. And, and maybe also uh, give us some insight on, and key takeaways from the recent Transforming Education Summit that happened in, in New York in, in September. So thank you very much to the five of you uh, for being here with us today. And uh, what we would like is to keep this discussion as informal as possible. So please don't hesitate to react to what you will hear from other uh, panelists. And we will also have questions from the from the audience. Uh, but first of all, I would like to ask you to react to what you've just heard from uh, the students and give us like some initial quick reaction uh, to, to this presentation. Valérie, would you like to, to start? Or who would like to start? First reaction will be congratulations again. And really, it's a uh, it makes really sense and um, what you explain in a different way you suggested it. It's really yes. Congratulations, this is my first wish. Okay. My first reaction. <laughs> okay, but on, on the content of what you heard, uh, maybe on the innovative practices that you are familiar with, uh, have you heard something that uh, resonates with what you are doing? Yeah. Uh, in your master's degree or in, in the Marima project in yeah. the past? For example, I can use one example. Yeah. yeah. For example, with uh, what we call field school. Field school, it's it's not a just a field trip as we can imagine. It's just not just you know going on the field and do some observation to understand some scientific processes. It's not just this. The idea of a field school, it's it's much more like a, a school of of life, in fact. We will be together during during a week, during 10 days, and all together with students from different universities, from different countries, from different teachers, from different teachers. Uh, we will live together. We will identify a real study case, a real one. So we will meet the stake stakeholder to understand really uh, what they are facing every day. And we will try, only try, to draw the main lines of this 
this real case on scientific aspect. And of course, when I say science, I say, well, pathology, ecology, but sociology, of course, and so on. So we will have to mix uh, all, uh, all these things. So it is true, it is um, fully transdisciplinary, but each student does not need to have skills in transdisciplinarity. He, he needs, uh, I will say, the skill to be able to listen to the other, to be able to work with the other, to give the hand. But he, he, he does not need to have all the knowledge himself and alone it will not be able to answer the solution. And it is a good way to make the students understand how really it is to work in a group, in a team, in a transdisciplinary team. The team is transdisciplinary, not the students by itself, you know. So, and on, on the other hand, it is uh, something very um, amazing is that uh, each student will have the opportunity at a moment or, or another one to be the expert for the team. He will have one knowledge, one little piece of knowledge that will help to solve the world problem. So it's very interesting on this aspect also to understand that we all have to learn from the other and that all together we are able to do it. So yes, this is one, yes, one training, I will say, we, we will have. We have this in a Charm Master. We have this in the Master. We had this in the Master Marema. Uh, so we, the first time I did it, it was in Yaoundé, in Cameroon, and it was the second time I, I went in, uh, in Africa with my students from the north and from elsewhere in Europe and from the south. It was, it was a, a huge moment. And, um, and we also do it in a master uh, of uh, water um, environmental management. I think it's a tool that can be used. Who would like to react? Jill, to Lian? <laughs> it is, so uh, what you've heard and... Yeah, well, congratulations again. It was really good. And uh, I was very impressed by the quality of the presentation. And also, by the way, uh, each of the presentation was um, uh, was covering a different uh, thematics, like Aja, who mentions a lot um, the behavior change and the critical thinking. And uh, Jung Jung mentioned uh, a lot of the work as an education specialist of, uh, to be done on the curricula. And uh, Anael, I think you, may, you were focusing a lot on tra transdisciplinarity and uh, the collaboration between the different um, uh, disciplines, uh, social science and science in particular. So I just wanted to jump right up to you because um, field trip, uh, I also think that it's very important like I just said, we have all been students, or we have students now. Um, I think uh, as an agronomist, agronomy can be seen as a scientific um, um, scientific um, area, but in fact, everything that I've done, I've never tackled really technical or scientific issues, but social issues. Because when you try to answer, um, uh, a problem or a challenge, uh, you have to look at the context where you are, what are the problems, where are the problems from, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So in fact, uh, it's a lot of uh, social sciences, you look at uh, what, uh, what uh, how the situation uh, arrived and uh, what is the issue between the social issues in the, in a, within a community, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a uh, very important to to mix to mix uh, science and uh, social science. And uh, another point that I wanted to come to is the mentorship. I know some of you have gone through mentoring programs, but in the Worldwide Fellowship Program, we have um, uh, we have a, a part of it, a work package. Uh, mentoring and uh, the process is that we have uh, a set of laureates who have won the scholarship well not the fellowship say, uh, and the laureates of the one the fellowships are young researchers young below 40 years old which is young for researcher <laughs> <laughs> um, they are selected through a very high uh, selection process 
who are a partner in African Witches Awards, African Women for Agriculture uh, Research and Development. Uh, and uh, the basis of the Wonder Ecology program is the mentoring, because they are, uh, the, the researchers are mentored uh, by uh, an African mentor uh, in Africa. And some of them are given the chance by Agropolis Foundation uh, to come to Europe and to work uh, as an equal with other researchers in Europe and to learn skills from Europe. Uh, but we want this to be, uh, we, don't want, we do not want to go to the top down <laughs> that we, we don't want to go to that anymore. But they are learning and they are included in, within a research team. And then uh, after having been mentored, uh, they become themselves mentors and they mentor uh, an African young, younger <laughs> researcher and also uh, young scientists from Europe. So the African uh, researcher become mentors for uh, uh, European uh, scientists on the basis that everyone can learn from everyone and on the basis of face-to-face uh, -face meetings. So the Europeans are also given the chance to come to Africa uh, to learn the context and uh, the techniques and, uh, uh, how, uh, and uh, the, the challenges uh, that, are, that need to be tackled. And, uh, and then they have a follow-up uh, every month for an hour online uh, with their mentors in Africa. So we are outside of the classroom and uh, we get a sense of what are the issues in the field uh, and we try to they try to, to develop uh, solutions or uh, develop their own skills for their own uh, professional skills. Yeah, it, it's both a scientific mentoring, but also a generation mentoring. And it's something that we haven't tackled in our, directly in our bank communication. And I think it's also uh, an important and interesting part. Jim, you heard some uh, key words about the project in Montpellier, co-construction, interdisciplinarity, soft skills, in lab experiences. Sure. Yeah. First of all, I would like to join uh, my colleagues uh, of the panel to say that I was really impressed by what uh, you achieved. It was huge work and uh, you split your presentation in a in very uh, clever uh, way uh, with um, exploring different uh, areas of, uh, of what can be done in education and i have to say that uh, not only you, uh, you you do that but also you clearly identify the needs uh, we have to change uh, the education to, to be able to to face the transition we need and uh, i was very pleased because yeah sorry I, I was very pleased because all what you you say uh, where the are, are actually the pillars of uh, what you set up in uh, Charmi U uh, European University, in particular in the master. You mentioned the, the need for collaborative work. You, you need the need to train the trainers, uh, to train the teacher. Uh, the need for interculturality and interdisciplinarity uh, to be able to, to break. Uh, the, the silos that exist in between the discipline, but also structurally inside the universities. For example, in between faculties, and it's very difficult to 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 set up new programs due to the structure in itself. You you identify also the needs to uh, to, to break the, the 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 distinction and also the ranking in between practical knowledge uh, and and also theoretical one by bringing together all these. Two types of, of, uh, of knowledge. Uh, you, you, you mentioned, and you, you're fully right, the, the fact that to learn, you have to tackle a real challenge. So, challenge based learning, uh, in my opinion, is the key because it can include everything uh, the, the, the field, the players, uh, this, all the stakeholders. If you do challenge based learning, it's, if it is real challenge, you have to go out of the university, out of the classroom. Uh, the need to be flexible. Uh, to learn out of the classroom, to recognize the skills you, you can have out of the classroom, you say that, and, uh, and the need also to, to build trust, and this is part of uh, inter interculturality. So what I wanted to say that once we have 
all of all that needs in, in mind and, and everybody uh, could share that. We have to think about um, two things, I think. The first one is uh, the, the transition, not, the, not how, to how the education can help uh, to, to face the transition we have, but also how to imply, uh, to implement transition inside the education, inside the university. And this is not so easy because the system is not programmed to do that. The people inside are people that stay for a long time. They, 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 they build their career on a very old fashion of behaving, of teaching, and it's very huge uh, difficulty to, to do that. So one key of the problem is how to, uh, what are the process, what are the, the structure, and including the political one inside the university to be able to, 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 to implement transition. And, and uh, the, the, the second thing is that we know that Ideal education, like the one you, you, you paint, and uh, with all the need we list, is efficient. It builds fantastic initiative, and 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 uh, the student that comes uh, out of this kind of program are very happy and will be leaders afterwards. So we know that it is it is good, but it is utterly expensive, and the sustainability should be think also inside the program. So concretely how to be sustainable when we want to implement mentorship, field trips, and so on. We, we, we know it is expensive because we experiment that through different programs. Uh, and so, of course, we have money which is injected uh, from different uh, places, Europe or whatever, to, to push us. But once money is, is, uh, is off, then we have to continue that and also not to address this kind of program to a couple of handful of students it's 100 students in, in a master is nothing we have to think much big to, to have an impact to reach an impact and so all the needs and all the the, the thing you propose uh, should be uh, transformed and should be implemented on the real uh, life of the university by thinking about how to get resources uh, human resources, but also money to do that. So th that's that's also a political program pro problem we have to face. So transition within the university, sustainability, but maybe also a change of uh, mindset. And uh, Deborah, would you like? We cannot see you very well anymore. Here, quite dark on your side, but would you like to to do what you just said? So I'm sorry, I, I don't hear. Uh, uh, can you hear us now? Um, <laughs> so Stel, uh, Gilles was just mentioning that uh, education should, should be with efficient outside uh, and challenges, but that one of the main issues was also uh, within the university and sustainability program. And that's okay. why also my uh, change of mindset, um, mind, change of mindset on the side of political intensity uh, mm -hmm. of uh, trainers of students, uh, as uh, um, our reporters were presenting before. What do you think about that? Uh, in first, um, I'm I'm very impressed um, by. Uh, by Ajar, uh, Kim, and Anael, I think all this, <laughs> and, uh, um, and narrative, and, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the teachers, uh, need train. <laughs> it's a, it's a great, uh, great problem. And, and say to, uh, another, um, to say, uh, need, uh, um, to change behavior, um, I, I write. We have to change mind. Uh, okay, all it say, um, and um, I think um, um, there are and Jill, Jill too. There are two things uh, already. Uh, little 
discuss problem, a big dust step uh, under the carpet. Uh, but uh, Jean Jaurès said already, we teach what we are. And uh, we must to transform education and, uh, um, and, the, and the trainer. Uh, how can you help students to find meaning uh, if we are no reference point? Uh, if the dispositions of some colleagues, researchers <laughs> in meeting uh, are the same in class, what, uh, what interest, what uh, meaning for students? Yes, we know that the relationship between uh, the student and the teacher change with age. The, the relationship is emotional with the young students, but more rational with age. But if you don't admire uh, our teacher, add, uh, admire uh, is add and mirror, um, add to look. Uh, there is um, there is less uh, radiance, less connection with the teacher and the knowledge. Um, yes, uh, we know the Pygmalion effect, uh, the self-fulfilling uh, prophecy, and it's very very important. And so we uh, we must change uh, the mindset, but the the, re the relationship between teacher and student. And it's said uh, by the student uh, PhD, um, um, uh, it's very courageous, and we uh, we must um, take uh, this uh, this problem. I think. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Paul, how what you heard until now resonates with maybe what you heard during the transforming education summit. And I just yeah. would like here to remind the objective of this uh, of this summit. Um, that that was actually um, uh, okay. I, I yes, sorry. Uh, I quote: uh, the objective was to uh, tackle a global crisis in education and to elevate education to the top of the global political agenda and saw the tip to transform education in a rapidly changing world. Hmm. So, what do you right. think about that? Uh, have you heard answers uh, that uh, match this objective and, and resonate yeah. right here? So, uh, can, can you everyone hear me okay? Very yes. well. Yeah, very good. Um, so, first of all, um, thank you, Patrick, Karen, and, and um, and Magic, the team, for inviting me. It's a, it's a, it was a very, very, um, very important topic, and um, I really enjoyed the three presentations. Um, so before I get to transforming the education summit, I just maybe just uh, address the three presentations in the work of the SDG Academy, just to to, to highlight it, and then offer an invitation for something. Um, so I think we do work on three pillars. Um, the first pillar is content, and as you could call it in the second presentation, I think that was by Kim, uh, on curriculum and curriculum development. And I absolutely agree with you that even though we create these online MOOCs that are on edX, um, they are pretty high level. Um, when, you, when, when it actually gets to the important stuff, like the economists or the engineers or environmental science or the psychologists and all the different disciplines, Actually, mainstreaming um, uh, mainstreaming this type of content that we're talking about, a lot of work has to be done. And I do appreciate the idea that that has to be co-created, right? Um, so, in a sense, in our in our in our in our second piece of work, um, and this is to do with it, it can feed into learning practices as well, which is our um, pedagogy. Um, we are actually working with the private sector, sitting down with them to say, well, how would you actually do ESD training with government departments and UN systems to say, well, how do we actually mainstream a sustainable development education into the workings of the UN and to government departments and even with NGOs themselves? Today, you are very focused, obviously, I think, uh, in the sense of curriculum inside the university, which itself is very interesting, how you move away from electives into sort of mainstreaming 
sustainable development education into the various uh, disciplines and the different approaches you could, you could take. Um, and I think it is quite right that the academics themselves have to say we're prisoners of our background and our training and our disciplines, and we just have to be that little bit more open uh, to, to dialogue and to understanding. But at the same time, I would say the key constraint uh, is that science is created and knowledge is created, and we have to respect how that is done through gaining a PhD, through peer reviewed data, you know, peer reviewed processes, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to stick with those standards, but at the same time, you have to work with the students and and everyone in the in the system to come up with you know a new a new a new curriculum. So where I think though the the point I think that Hajar made about learning practices. So I think science has to be a knowledge has to be done with the same rigor. You know whether it's for sustainable development per se. We do have those processes, but we should be open to chaining learning practices. And what I mean by this is that rather than somebody just teaching and a straight exam as if there's some sort of knowledge to be transferred, I think making the students the agents of change to empower students to and uh, is actually at all levels is actually really important. So I think we can change our assessment structures. We can change the way we do our projects. We can make them more applied. We can make them more solution orientated. And I think everything that Hajar basically said there, Hajar was saying, uh, about um, you know, and uh, you know, uh, empathy and under and, and bringing everyone in and everyone being someone that can contribute. So you might know the science, but how you translate it into practice, how you actually make it effective, this is not out there, and that everybody can be involved in this with every sort of background. So, um, so on pedagogy, I think that's a kind of a different thing to me to content and to curriculum. And I, I don't know whether you're interested in separating them out or not, but in my mind, I, I separate them out a little bit, right? Um, and then the last point was the community of practice uh, by um, what I call, uh, and uh, so in our area, we call it community of practice. This is Anel, which is um, working with academics, working with private sector people, government people, NGO people, you know, to, to really understand um, that the knowledge that's created, as, as she said, is not necessarily virtuous. It's not necessarily for the public good um, and so on and so forth. And that actually there has to be a good bit of dialogue between stakeholders uh, in terms of the orientation of the knowledge we create and how we disseminate and, and use it. Right. Um, and, and again, this is a, a body of work. And we call that what well, we call it in our work. So we have our content, which we create. We have pedagogy, where we actually do professional certs and master programs, et cetera, et cetera, you know, for training academics, training government folks, training private sector. And I call that more pedagogy. Uh, but the community of practice is to really say, actually, we don't know exactly what we're doing and that we have to come together as stakeholder groups and we have to create this material. Um, but I do think academics, have to step up though, in the sense that they have to take the lead and they have to insist on best practices of academic peer review uh, and standards, et cetera, even though we are admitting that maybe we didn't have the right knowledge, we weren't applying the knowledge properly, we're not necessarily trained properly to teach or create this, that's fine. Um, but at the same time, uh, the process of creating knowledge and peer review and standards is actually still very, very important. Um, so if you're interested, and this is just an invitation to the students, the SG Academy is re redoing our blog. Um, and if you wanted to um, take this session and uh, put up the recording of each individual uh, student talk and put it into a blog, I'm happy to put it up on our, on our website and, and promote it. Uh, and we can also promote it as part of Mission 4.7. So this is one of our community of practices that we are secretariat to. Um, so Mission 4.7 is goal four, uh, target seven. And this is about lifelong learning. Uh, so from preschool all the way through K-12 and up, all the way through university, all the way through employment, basically to, to debt. Um, we're encouraging a continuum of sustainable development education. And the partnership in here is uh, UNESCO, uh, the Ban Ki-moon Centre, 
uh, Columbia University, Pontifical Academy of Science and Social Science in Rome, um, and obviously the SG Academy and so on. And we have events. So again, the blog would be promoted in, in, in mission in mission 4.7. So to just to say congratulate the students because like this issue of content, you know, pedagogy, learning how it's how it's done and taught and how to inspire people or make people effective learners, and then the community of practices, how this is delivered into society, into policy, into uh, uh into um I'm missing someone, um uh, some other stakeholder into stakeholders in general, like these do deserve taught. And I think it's important that academics and academic institutions take the lead in this, because for too often, academic institutions allow the government, they allow civil society, they allow the private sector to dictate to them what they should do, what they should be funded for, what they should teach, how they should teach. And now it's time for the academy to say, no, we're more independent. We do things for the public and the common good, where all we are is to is to help and promote students and young people, uh, and that we have to drive change. And we have to tell governments, private sector, civil society, and the rest of the world that this is what we want, right? That this is the world we want, and this is how we should go about our business, right? So this is not easy for the academy at the moment, uh, but I think it's um, this sort of independent thinking and sort of freedom uh, for, for academics and academic thought uh, has to be unleashed for us to have this transformation in education. And, and the three pillars that were brought up today, I thought were excellent. And then finally, I'll just talk about Transforming Education Summit. So what I say to you is UNESCO have a pathway to 2030. They have an SDG4 steering committee which is a stakeholder committee. It's very good. It has, you know, regional commissions, UN folks, government folks, youth, academics. It has everyone. Uh, so, uh, and obviously, ACT students can get involved in, in, in the youth participation. Um, they had a pre-summit in Paris, and then they had their summit in, uh, in, in New York in the General Assembly. The first day was uh, what's called the Youth Engagement Day. And I would say to all of you to read the Youth Declaration. It's a very powerful document, okay? It's a list of demands that young people want when it comes to transforming education. It's six pages, and I think you should read uh, the Youth Declaration. Uh, and it was one of the outcomes of the Transforming Education Summit. The second day was Solutions Day. Um, the Academy was part of that. We had a session uh, with a whole group of stakeholders on what's called the UNESCO OER recommendation. This is called Open uh, Education Resources. So one thing we're pushing for here is that all, all these papers and curriculum and case studies and, and ways of learning, um, you have to put them in your local repository, your libraries. Uh, you've got to put an open license on them and you've got to share them across the world. You cannot paywall that type of knowledge and that sort of thinking anymore, right? That's happened with publications, it's happened with data, but it cannot happen to educational resources, right? Education resources, all countries of the world have signed up to a decorate to the OER recommendation of 2019 that education resources have to be free to everyone. Okay, so if I'm in lower school or primary or secondary school, if I'm in university, if I'm a lifelong learner. I can get education resources for free, books, worksheets, exams, exams, answers, case studies. These have to be free to everyone. Um, and every government has signed up to this. Now, how to do this is another story, but that's what we're working on using technology, using open licenses and so on. Um, but that's what we was one of the solutions we were working on on Solutions Day. And then finally, there was the Transforming Education Summit itself, which was a disaster because all the leaders were at the Queen's funeral uh, on, in, on Monday, the, uh, the 19th in, in, in London, okay? And when you ask that question, was this a successful outcome to, to mobilize, put education at the center of the UN agenda or the global agenda and into the leaders? Uh, the way you watch it is the statements by governments on September 19th, they weren't there because they were at the Queen's funeral, and in the, in the actual general debate, 
how many of the leaders actually mentioned uh, transforming education as a priority? None. Not one single leader mentioned anything about the Transforming Education Summit, okay? So, but, I, but the good news is the bureaucratic side of the UN, the Secretariat, all the stakeholders that were involved in, in um, the pre-summit and the Solutions Day are very empowered. And the UNESCO itself is very empowered by its ministerial panels up to 2030. And the whole system is quite angry at what happened. And there are absolutely, we are going to, par in the partnership forum, we're going to put a spotlight and elevate transforming education to number one priority for partnership led by government. And this will happen in January. It'll also be elevated in the uh, SDG summit in the General Assembly in, in 2023. Uh, OK, so I think uh, and in this SDG stimulus, which is getting finance for sustainable development, Jeffrey Sachs and Matmina Hamad and others and the General Secretary are prioritizing spending on education and financing education so that it's at least at, let's say, 20 percent of people's fiscal spend across each country, at least 44 percent of GDP, and that it's a much bigger fraction of philanthropic and overseas development aid than it is at the moment. So I was so in terms of was it successful? I think so, because actually the machinery and the bureaucratic side of governments, let's say, and the UN and UNESCO and academics are fired up to make this happen. Um, but the leadership have to catch up. Uh, and unfortunately, there was a, a few problems with the Transforming Education Summit where because it was the General Assembly, uh, the secretaries insisted that leaders should only speak and not ministers for education. But when they found out they couldn't speak, they didn't come. Um, and then the, the Queen Elizabeth died, and then the leaders didn't come. So then nobody came uh, on September 19th, and that was a real problem. Um, but there is a, a determination to fix that. Um, and, uh, and I think... Uh, those working on transforming education, uh, this is going to be the priority. It is the enabler of all transitions, as you said yourself in, in this session. Um, and uh, just watch this space in terms of what's going to happen with transforming education over the next few years, particularly the private sector are doing a huge job in ESG training and hiring. Uh, the governments are starting to do it. The universities are starting to do it. Um, so it's going to be a lot of work. Uh, but I, I wouldn't, uh, I'm not, I'm energized from the tests, if you like. I'm not demotivated uh, for what, what, what happened. Okay. But again, great presentations today. The invitation is to be part of the blog. And there's also an invitation when we organize things for 4.7. We always involve youth. So you will get an invitation. And also, if you want to get involved uh, with UNESCO, just sign up and be involved in the, the youth um, section of that steering committee uh, that's that's driving the, the the 2030 pathway in terms of transforming education. Thank, thank you very much, Paul, and, and thank you for very for being very blunt about uh, how things were going in in New York in September, and I hope it was a uh, uh, it was a circumstances the, the circumstances were not uh, ideal for this summit as I as I understand. But uh, it's good that you can see the positive side of it and that the system is mobilized. And uh, we will of course answer positively to your nice proposal to join the the blog and and the UNESCO uh, uh, initiative. So that's for sure. If you can send us the the details and and we will send you the material. Thank you. Um, after this first round of presentation, I would like to open the floor for any questions, comments, uh, uh, if you want to share uh, initiatives that you are also involved uh, in. And please don't be shy. Uh, here it's really an informal setting, so we encourage you to, uh, to speak and, and to share your, your ideas. So I don't know who would like to speak first, and maybe I can repeat the question. You can address them to one of the panelists or to all of them. Uh, and I will repeat so that people online can, can hear them properly. Who would like to start? Yes, Viviana. Uh, good 
I I will repeat. I will repeat. Like to, to share with you concern that I have a long time. Uh, thinking about the process to transform the education and maybe even to transform the work of education. Because uh, you said it was the topic's invention of the individual perspective of quality, the trust. Um, that are very informal and relating some types of knowledge. Because um, in the traditional way, uh, science and uh, work trying to educate the science, it's only one voice. Uh, it's the voice of the expert, uh, the voice of the uh, academic or the formal institution. And it's very biased, say, uh, received on a type of knowledge. It's the same as the common So uh, I always, I am scared. <laughs> the programs from the government, for example, when we need to educate the people, I think it's a dominant universe, but it's very dangerous. And maybe power of the world, not change the world education. Uh, I would like to thank you for my Michael Chen and I'd like to hear you because um, I like the first piece of the student that say we need more focus in the learning process than the education process. So uh, well I would like to hear your your Hi. ideas. So, Thank you. Oh, I, I will just repeat your question for, for people online. This was a question from uh, Viviana Bilbao, who is one of uh, our fellows at, at Make It. Um, and Viviana was asking uh, whether we should actually change the word education um, because we request to educate uh, people in a formal way, in a one way uh, process uh, that actually does not seem to take into account other kind of knowledge uh, such as indigenous knowledge and, and local uh, consideration so i don't know maybe Valérie, you would like to answer that because um through your experiences you were really uh, using uh, field priorities and field experiences i'm thinking about the marina uh, project uh, which was really anchored in local priorities, and I and I know that you mobilize also um, local expertise. And can you can you give us an example? Yes, it's a very hard question. <laughs> I mean, for me, education. What is the meaning of education? For me, it's a meaning I want to put aside. It was the other idea. Of we teach where we are, and I think education is yes, it's, it's my way of being this kind of teacher. So I'm not sure I need to change the, the, the world, but maybe to be sure that everybody will understand what we are talking about. What is education? What is transdisciplinarity? We didn't define it. What are we talking about the same thing? You use also the word resilience. Are we talking about the same thing? I'm sure we are not. I'm sure we can do the test. I did it with the students and we were not talking about the same thing. So because when we come from social science, we will have a certain definition of transdisciplinarity where we will find, I think, what you mean is that uh, what I understood from my colleague, okay, because I'm not from social science, is that if they have this interaction with the stakeholders, if the stakeholders are involved in the research, then it is transdisciplinarity. And when I ask to a panel of uh, scientists, what is transdisciplinarity? They, ex they answer, uh, oh, he's a chemistry, she's from agro agronomy, I am from hydrology. We will mix this, even from social science, we can mix this. It will be transdisciplinarity, but in the way of answering the, the question. So 
I mean, it's the same for education. What do we want? What, what is education? And can we just define our way we want it to be? And yes, it has to change. But I'm not sure the word, the, the, the word education has to change. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I think it's more difficult. <laughs> Something to, to say about that. Deborah, would you like to react? Uh, yes. Um, there, there are lots of um, different um, definitions of uh, interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, and all researchers have got his definition. <laughs> Uh, and in the world, <laughs> it, it, and it's very, very, uh, very hard. And so, uh, when we talk about interaction, uh, we think it's uh, um, interdisciplinarity. Uh, yes, uh, in interdisciplinarity, there there are interactions, but uh, not uh, not. It's not enough. Uh, there is a very um, um, um intercommunicational inter, uh, uh, if you if you want we we uh, we we find the limits uh, the obstacles of meaning uh, the, uh, of the methodolo method methodology of uh, each discipline that that is interdisciplinarity uh, when we talk about transdisciplinarity we uh we we talk about um other other one um um uh, acknowledge that uh, that surface uh, that uh, beyond the, the the knowledge of a different uh, dis discipline so it's um i think it's very difficult to speak trans uh, interdisciplinarity just just we we have to um speak uh, um, speak about speak about um interaction and uh, communication it say uh, before we we have to discuss uh, together and we have to discuss with students with uh, other co uh, colleague uh, researcher and know that we are uh, we, that we have different ontology, uh, different uh, um, uh, form of thinking. And uh, when I when I present my uh, my my way my my way to um, to to see the world, and when I uh, when I listen the way of the other researcher and the and the other um, um student now i i am in connection with with her with him with uh, with them and it's very important uh, in the um, in the communi scientific communication and in the uh, in the reliance uh, in the in the link uh, it's very, very uh, important. And uh, I think, sorry? Yeah, Deborah, do you think this, uh, this, what you are describing is also true with the word education? Is it like a, a one-way process or do you also perceive this interaction in, in the word education? Uh, in the word, um, interdisciplinarity in the word education? So I, the, the question was about education. Should we should we transform, change this word because it's a one-way process and there is not this interaction you were describing, or, or maybe not. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, I think uh, in indication we uh, we have to uh, work the the reliance problem. Uh, what is uh, reliance? Um, in the in the broad sense, um, it's creating link between. Um, well, it's um, well, creating link between social actors, uh, stakeholders, if you want. In specific sense, uh, it's a it's an action to create or recreate link between social actor and the society tend to separate and isolate. In education, we must 
uh, teach the reliance and the, re the reliance between one person and her personality, her psychic, uh, psychological uh, instances. Uh, it's a psychological uh, reliance. And uh, our mindset is to isolate, to clarify, to uh, cut. Cut body. Uh, when I uh, have a pain on my hand, uh, I go to a neurolog uh, neurologist. But perhaps the pain comes from uh, in another uh, case. Okay, then we we cut, and it's a very uh, a problem. And uh, we much uh, we, we oh, sorry we have to we have to um, teach this reliance the reliance on um, uh, on myself. There is an, another reliance, is a reliance between one person, one person to another person or group. It's a psych psychological reliance. It's very important to the communication, uh, to, uh, to understand, to listen the other. And it's, it's a, um, there, there, is, there, there is a lake in education. There is, uh, see, uh, two, the reliance between one person and human spaces. Mm -hmm. There, very, uh, that is, uh, um, is, uh, awareness of his uh, place in the long evolution of living uh, system. It's, uh, the ontologic and anthropologic reliance. If I don't know my places, uh, my place in the, in the world, in the uh, ecosystem, I don't, uh, I don't understand, uh, the, the crisis, actual crisis. I don't understand, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the pain, the pain of the, uh, of the, of the world. And there is another reliance between one person and natural elements, cosmological elements. That is a cosmic reliance. And when we teach, uh, when we, uh, when we teach um, um, to our students, we must we must uh, teach this reliance. And um, perhaps you, you know uh, Edgar Morin in uh, 1999 uh, proposed a seventh knowledge uh, to uh, to uh, the to the tomorrow's education, the future education. And if subject, we, uh, we are to teaching the blindness of knowledge, perhaps error, uh, not perhaps error or illusion and self deception. And it's very important. We have to teaching, uh, the knowledge of knowledge, uh, the knowledge, uh, and um, it's relevant. Um, the principles of relevance uh, knowledge, teaching to the human condition and teaching uh, the earth identity, the entire solidarity. And when we, we touch entire solidarity, we touch uh, a, a, um, a topic very interesting is the soft skills. And I think in education, we, uh, we, we have to uh, teach the soft skills, the how to be, uh, um, the, the know how, the know how to be. And it's very important for the student and for the teacher too, I think. And, and we go back the, to that, the ecosystemic uh, approach, which, which may answer part of your question. Uh, there are many questions, uh, other questions. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you very much. There are many questions in, in the room. Um, and maybe, Paul, uh, we, we can take other questions, but uh, I would have liked maybe later to have thought about this indigenous uh, knowledge and what is the reach of the SDG Academy on that. But maybe we can get other questions and collect them and have a global answer. Who would like, there was a question behind, I think, first. Yeah. Go ahead. If you can speak loudly, if not, I will answer. I will be fake. Um, the question is slightly different, but um, I wanted to know uh, don't you think that we should be like the university should be collaborating with educators in um, high school, primary school, because I think that if we 
idea of transdisciplinarity, right? Transport education starts when children are young and have a great impact on the get to university. Could they already have an idea of what the goal and even the goal of the society? So, this is the issue because I have more knowledge. It's not yeah, great, great question about uh, lifelong <laughs> learning processes and collaboration between uh, university, high school, primary schools to have this uh, continuity in uh, learning practices and and innovation that just not happen only at the university but start at an early age. Maybe we can collect another question and then we will uh, take the next one. Um. Thank you for your presentations. Uh, I was willing to share actually a few thoughts and probably asking two questions. Um, because we we're in Montpellier, uh, it's the Charm EU uh, Alliance. Uh, I'm just coming from Toulouse and I was willing to share the, the, the experience of one engineering school in Toulouse called INSA, part of the INSA group and member of the ECIU Alliance. Uh, European University, and they are actually one of the pillar is challenge-based learning. Uh, so they're involving uh, at the at the state of uh, defining the the challenge. Many different stakeholders, be it students, teachers, uh, civil society, uh, private company, NGOs, whatever you name it, you have it, and they, they bring all these people together to actually define one challenge that will be afterwards uh, taken by a group of teachers and uh, put into pedagogical material for uh, the, the students. So the, you can go online and, and check the, the challenges, uh, the process, that, that's interesting because it is building bridges from uh, very uh, core competencies, scientific competencies, and more soft skills oriented uh, competencies. Um, so yeah, that, that's one example. And just it's a made up word, but the teachers are not teachers anymore. They are teachers. They're not coach. They're teachers. Um, there's another about the the rescheduling uh, the schedules of uh, um, the curriculum. Uh, there are a few examples uh, in France. One, one is it's called the, it's actually coming from a think tank called the Shift Project, uh, who's involved, uh, they're paid by uh, universities or uh, uh, schools. Uh, they're paid to help schools, university to rethink the curriculum. Uh, so it, it, it's just one example, but it, it, the work is in process, so to say. Um, and Erasmus Plus is actually supporting as well the, the, the student engagement beyond the classrooms. Uh, every institution involved in an Erasmus Plus uh, project uh, is actually uh, asked to report how students are engaged beyond classrooms. So not every institution is doing that great, but at least uh, they, they're asking the question. Um, and actually, that leads me to the, the questions. Uh, one personal reflection question that I have is how to evaluate the soft skills. Because uh, not everything can be inter-transdisciplinary. Uh, if you want to make a, a great uh, scientist in uh, water engineering, management, whatever, they need to know their stuff in water engineering. Uh, but uh, when you, you, you bring the students in classrooms with uh, uh, different teachers and uh, you build up a, a course on whatever, uh, how do you evaluate soft skills? That, that's for me a big issue. Yeah. And how do you find that um, uh, uh, equilibrium actually between uh, interdisciplinarity and core competencies? Uh, yeah, so if you want to train a, a physicians, uh, it's good that they speak good English, that they have social skills uh, and everything, but they, they need to know physics. So yeah, how do you define, how do you find that equilibrium? Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you very much for these very uh, interesting insights. I, I propose that we stop here and we will have another round of questions. Where are you coming from? Uh, the Sirad. Sirad, okay. Um, I think on that, uh, and, and also on the lifelong uh, learning, and do you have any? Yeah, there, there is ma many things to, to say and to, to discuss about that, uh, about lifelong learning. And I, I fully support what was said about that. Uh, unfortunately, university has not alone the power to change the education or the, or the learning process. And uh, it has to be a world, uh, a world collaboration and a world uh, uh, process which starts from the early ages and which includes all the players, including the, the teacher for the, the primary school and so on. So one of the key, uh, well, of course, it's public policies, uh, but one of the key should maybe go through the faculty of education, which are maybe, uh, uh, which are maybe uh, uh, teaching and uh, which are maybe uh, producing teacher for, for all, also for younger, for younger students, for younger scholars. And I think faculty of education should be much more connected and as much as possible with uh, the other uh, education so we have to break barrier and facilitate the transfer and the uh, and the uh, and the um, let's say and the meetings and, uh, and the collaboration between the faculty of education and the the faculty of, uh, of all the science and social science and so on so that that is one of maybe one of the the idea of course inviting uh, all the players of education uh, in, in, uh, to, to think about the content of the program. And then I, I come back to, to what you said. It's exactly what we've done with Charm, exactly the same. We build what we call KCT, which are a knowledge creation team, which combine all the players, including uh, NGOs, uh, companies, and so on, to define uh, what would be the content of the curriculum. And that's, that we ended up with a program which are created from scratch, but by interdisciplinary uh, and intercultural international teams. And so the, the, the society and, uh, and the specialists and come together to propose to the university uh, the curriculum. And this uh, back and forth, because once uh, the curriculum is created, of course, we we, we provide, uh, we create knowledge, we create students with competency that go to fertilize also the, their, their environment. And that this kind of uh, two-side two arrow is uh, one key of the success of, uh, of making the university a, a big player uh, to, to change the world. So, uh, uh, of course, it's difficult. But because it, it's resources, as you said, it's not no, the teacher are completely changing the way of teaching. But the the way we are paid by the governments, I don't I don't talk about only the French government. Uh, within the alliances, European alliances, we see many different type of system of recognition from the work of the of the professor. But most of the system, unfortunately, you are not uh, uh, you are not assessed. You are not paid uh, uh, the way uh, for, for the task you have to do to tackle this new way of teaching. So I am paid just to give one face-to-face -face lecture. I'm not paid to be a mentor, uh, to support the student, to, be, uh, to, to go out to meet the stakeholder, to organize a new way of teaching. So this has to be changed in a systemic way, if you want to achieve impact, not only on small, shiny program like the one of your, uh, uh, the European universities or whatever, or like the ED we have, but if you want to achieve a real impact of the, on the universities, we have to rethink the way teachers are assessed. And I include also the researcher. So it's crazy to think, for example, that we, we, we cannot mobilize resources easily from researchers. CNRS, CIRAD, and, and so on, and all the organisms of research, because among them there are plenty of competencies, uh, ideas, and way of, of teaching in another way, and we have to rely on mostly only on the process of, of uh, teacher researcher, which I think it's it's not it's 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 a missed opportunity. 
So, uh, thank you. Paul, would you like to react to that? Uh, you were mentioning yeah. that practitioner needs to take the lead, but how can yeah. they do that when yeah. they are not recognizing so, that position? So I just say I had a let's give another talk at uh, in five minutes. So um, I first want to thank everyone, and I really am sorry to miss because it's just getting exciting now. Just uh, I've been here for a few hours, but now it's getting exciting, and I need to go. But um, yeah, just to go on that thought, right? That you know, when I uh, academics in general, let's say they're quite vocational, like in a lecture hall. What do they say? This is the knowledge that's supposed to be there. They spend most of their time criticizing it. They ask the students to come up with new ways of thinking. You know, it's not all about consumption of knowledge. It's also, you know, teaching or hopefully getting people to be creators of knowledge. And particularly if they do a thesis and went to their master's and PhD, et cetera. Right. So so this is not uh, just to go back to this a very good point about the external environment. Right. I don't set the curriculum. The governments and it's normally by committee set the curriculum for schools um, and it's very much done in mind with assessments because people want to be assessed they want grades they want to actually get into good schools or into colleges etc so even in the way the curriculum is done it's done in a way that can be these are the 10 things you should know we can probably stand over them that you show that you know these 10 things you get an a and then you go to a good university, right? Now, that process, you know, which has nothing to do with the academic, uh, this is society, you know, wanting to be graded, wanting that type of assessment. Let's call it STEM, wanting that type of assessment. Um, and a lot of what we're talking about today is changing, you know, so somebody says, well, it can't be just STEM, it has to be non-STEM. We have to be able to assess and create other types of skills like critical thinking. Um, so and so on and create new ideas and knowledges right so the first thing is that the academics in some way should be dictating what's happening in k-12 and above but we're not there's another system and the same inside universities and the research somebody mentioned research foundations who tells them what are the research priorities you know it's ai it's security cyber security you know it's if you look at all the research priorities and the government are funding is it really for the common good? Is it really for sustainment development? Where can we get our research funds? How does it dictate who's hired in teaching, who's paid in teaching, and so on? So these are really good nuances. Um, and that's what I would say is we are being bossed by the external environment. It's the private sector, the government, NGOs, and other people with other agendas that are actually bossing what the curriculum is, how it's assessed, and why it's assessed, right? And it is a bit of a revolution that has to happen, but academics in their own training and in their own quest for knowledge are generally vocational and they are very open to saying, I don't, I don't know whether this is exact. We should critique this knowledge. We should uh, look for different angles, apply it in a different way. Um, and I'm sure that's what you get in the lecture halls, right? Uh, but then who wants the grades and why do you want the grades because you want to give it to a private sector company to say i'm a good person with a good reference and i have a first class honor um or you want to get into another school etc so um we should we should certainly be questioning who sets the curriculum who sets who trains the teachers in the way they teach why is the assessment this way why and, and where is there room to redefine what the curriculum should be and how it's taught and how it brings in stakeholders, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it is quite like it's, we are talking about a systemic change, but it's it's also dictated a little bit by the nature of government, private sector and civil society, as far as I'm concerned, All right? So it is quite challenging, but revolutions start in universities. And this is what the academics have to step up to. Thank you, Paul, for this uh, encouraging statement. And if you have to, to leave to another talk, please. Yeah. And, and thank you yeah. for that. I, I would like to collect other questions. Oh, there was we, one. we didn't answer to the soft skills assessment. Would you like to? A little, yes, please. <laughs> I don't know how to do in the current system, but what I'd like to do is that, for example, my student, uh, she's a spider. She knows how to clean. 
So I'd like to assess, uh, I'm talking about soft skill or math skill, not academic ones, but I'd like to assess her on his ability to clean. He's a fish, he's able to swim. I'd like to assess him on his ability to swim and not giving him a bad grade because he doesn't know how to clean or he cannot clean. And for me, all this aspect was about inclusivity, but I realized that it's not. In fact, when we are talking about inclusivity, we are not talking about little differences. We are talking about, I mean, serious cases, not, not so. So I don't know how to do, but it is what I'd like to do. Maybe some people in the room have ideas. There was the question from the beginning. Yeah, on the You can try to speak slowly. Yeah. If you can so speak. I'm telling you from the physics department at the home faculty, and uh, I would like to come back to the actual state because we have 50,000 students at the university, and we want to speak from maybe 10 persons according to the transition to 50 or 70 persons, and we have 6,000. Uh, professors and assistant professors. We are maybe 100 involved into this transition. We have to shift to 500. And we have barriers. We, we, we cited one barrier which is important it's about the barriers. Second one is about uh, from, uh, legitimating that. Because as a physics professor, uh, if I go beyond my expertise, my, my, my field of uh, research and, and teaching, I need uh, something strong and um, and from inductive sciences like maths, chemistry, physics, it's hard to go to other fields where the uh, inductive uh, thinking is not the main thing. For me, critical thinking and my view of from the disciplinary field is uh, when I do not only this inductive thinking uh, framework, I need critical thinking based on readings. Just to, to be able to teach to students about something I'm not an expert on. And for me, the first step was the IPCC report. And before that, I would never have the feeling to, to be able to, to say something to students in physics uh, about those things. And we have to break this barrier for our colleagues. And it's not easy, it's a question of careers, it's a question of time. But not only, we have to go to them and be able to let them do. Uh, you can uh, be out of your expertise field and, uh, and speak about it and be involved in the scientific knowledge project. Uh, but it's, it's hard and it's not what we were hired at the beginning for. So uh, it's about uh, life from uh, teaching also. Uh, but we have to go in, inside the department and meet every single people to. Thank you very much. And we go back to the same question that actually there is a will, uh, maybe not enough, but it's growing. But how can we do that? And if some people have solutions or ideas, please share them as well. Uh, yes, the first. Um, I don't want to hear about the point that I, I teach in uh, first of all, uh, I would like to remind our students that assistant professors and professors in French are not trained. There is no training <laughs> mandatory for <laughs> This is maybe a challenge. Uh, my, my question was another. Um, seeing that we need innovation. For me, it's an, an, an assumption that is not so obvious. Do we really need more knowledge or do we need to share the knowledge we already know, including uh, the indigenous knowledge? Uh, so, so uh, that are workers. I think the problem is that um, the university is uh, at a, a dominant position on the knowledge that is not uh, so obvious and justified. Maybe it can be 
how to actually uh, gather and communicate the knowledge or knowledge that we already have or that exist in a different way or make them accessible or you have a question if you can speak loudly in fact, I'm the educationalist of Chang Yu. So I just want to share some example of Chang Yu. Maybe you can inspire somebody else and get some answers because, yes, we face the challenge also sometimes of the assessment of the soft skills. And in Chang Yu, just like uh, she and I here are already had already uh, shared that we include so many soft skills that will help students to. Yeah, um, to be uh, more or to integrated to the job in the future in the project more easily, just like the communication. But sometimes as our education at the personalist and how we can prepare the assessment of our communication because communication skills can be so large. So in that case, sometimes first of all. And we, we need the design of the course establish uh, that maybe sometimes free classroom so that we can help the student to uh, develop the critical thinking and then also the skills of the day, something like that. And maybe based on this kind of uh, course, we need to develop the um, table to evaluate this one. Maybe just like the frequency of the uh, um, the interaction, the attitude of interaction, the structure of the places, something like that. So sometimes, yes, we can feedback it so that we can have the different feedback to different uh, students because uh, maybe that's the way also, I think, uh, um, answer to the needs of the lifetime learning because the lifetime learning is that everyone just develop way but sometimes uh, I think the most challenging thing is not develop the way of assessment so that the teacher can evaluate the, because the teacher first of all the KCT can have lots of experience so they can develop different way to the whole thing by a hybrid classroom or a local classroom they can review school and they know the objective of learning and they will always fly away maybe by the presentation maybe by series scans maybe sometimes by editing a report so we can uh, evaluate a little bit how the student can uh, um, how the student uh, manage some soft skills or, or knowledge because like the uh, the students share with us that nowadays we have uh, easy access to the knowledge, but how we can keep learning, keep developing, I think sometimes it's uh, for the future, maybe it's we try, we need to train the student how to evaluate themselves. But because sometimes we ask the student, yes, uh, for collaboration, collaboration is very important in the child view because they always work in project, always uh, also in the future, they will work together. And cooperation and how you can emulate your level of cooperation, I think it's really challenging. Uh, my PhD thesis is about the system of capacity. So we propose that there are two different uh, feelings, two different uh, auto uh, emulation. It's about uh, they feel that they they think I am capable of something. So this part is represent lot of uh, represent by the assessment who exists already nowadays, like the exam or knowledge or assessment is set up to evaluate uh, the students soft skills, something like that. But sometimes the other feeling just like I feel capable of something, the students don't know how to evaluate the exam. I feel like I can cooperate with the other them. Why the things don't work? And some, uh, in Chang, we have the mentor um, 
we have the mental system. So every student can have an individual support to help them to evaluate their soft skills. Just like maybe the day I said that, yeah, I know how to cooperate with the other, but what's my level of cooperation? And we need to push sometimes the student to think and what size of group or what size of project you already working and and what's the what's the the, the time you take uh, if, is that the project takes six months a year three years because different kinds of project different kinds of operation uh has for different sorts so this kind of mindset i think is important if we can develop in our uh, education system so we can uh, train the student to evaluate themselves to, so they can be more responsible, uh, responsible for her learning uh, um, for her learning for her learning program and then and then they can uh, little by little step by step in get into the live learning for the live learning mindset yes, yes, yes. I jump you had the question and you want to react to that this uh, auto evaluation you know, or is teaching students how to evaluate themselves because how to teach them as well. Yeah. Yes, I will answer to the both of you and uh, I will as well as answer to the question of how to evaluate subjects and uh, how to talk each other between how to respond to evaluation because I think uh, there is a bridge between the two. So uh, historically, and this is in literature, historically, our education system uh, was uh, constructed to meet the needs of uh, the needs of industrialism. Mm -hmm. And so the objective was to uh, let people go to the factories and work. And who is going to keep the kids? That's why the schools were built for. But now we don't, uh, we, uh, the objectives that have changed, we have more challenges. So we can't, we have to upscale our education system the objectives or else it's going to be contradictory and and it's not going to work this is uh this is uh, why we lost relevance in our education system and um there is one example i have read uh from someone from a speaker called simon Sinek in the u.s i think army or marine they evaluate uh performance of marines as well as the trust and they kind of build the graph if you have low performance low trust it's uh, you, you can't uh, participate. If you have higher uh, performance, higher trust, it's something really good. If you have uh, higher performance and low trust, uh, it's not really good. They prefer uh, the, uh, the, the students to have low, uh, higher trust and low performance, which means that uh, soft skills are really important. And how they do that, I think they do that through games, to trainings, uh, we have to put uh, our trainings into practice because we can have lectures about empathy, about communication, but if you don't go out in, in life and uh, put that in practice and make mistakes, you are never going to learn that. So first of all, we I think we should allow ourselves to uh, make mistakes. That's the first thing. Uh, you have to try, try to see if something is good or is bad and how can you change uh some things if it was if it, they weren't uh, really good because in for in classes we learn something and then do tests but i i i read that a long time ago in life you make mistakes and then learn so there is a test before the learning process and uh, that's so um, important to say i'm gonna add something but uh, it's not necessarily uh, to have a lecture of physics to understand what uh, physics. Uh, now I think I'm I forgot completely about all my lectures if, uh, because uh, I am a rural engineer by training, so I had like a, a more technical uh, uh, technical training. But as Nia, uh, when I went to the field, I met farmers and villagers, communities. I needed much more social skills. Uh, I will give you an example. Uh, farmers, most of farmers I have met in Morocco, they have never been to school, but they grow plants and I can't do that. So it's not necessarily about taking a course of physics, but yes, how can I understand this? How can I explain this to a child? Uh, and um, 
to give an example about uh, mistakes, uh, like if Thomas Edison didn't try uh, 10,000 times, I don't think we can be in the room with uh, we are going with no electricity. So it's important to uh, make mistakes and to keep trying, not blaming. Mm -hmm. I think we are doing mistakes, but also uh, we are making improvements. So, yeah. And I have one reaction to the first question, to the first concern about learning and education. Uh, I think, uh, yes, there are nuances because education, it's really, uh, when you say I'm going to educate you, it's like I, I'm making a hierarchy, I'm superior to you. And I think we do that uh, a lot in research uh, with the researcher because when we go to the field, we oh we know everything and we're going to educate you of how to do this or that. But no, but learning is learning together. It's like the two ways we are equal. And there's something that Ian uh, explained to me uh, while we were drinking our coffee. Uh, in fact, in their program, they gave the chance to African uh, uh, graduates to mentor Europeans. Usually, it's the complete opposite. We think that Africa is a place where there are diseases and people die of hunger and they are stupid. And it's uh, the role of Europeans to mentor them. But now they're doing good because Africa, for example, uh, I, is, is a, a continent. There are uh, there is a big and a huge cultural diversity, religion, gender, etc. And uh, learning is learning from together. I learn from you, you learn from me, and it's not a, a top-down. Uh, uh, yeah. So thank you, thank you, Asha. And uh, actually, I was uh, reading, I think, yesterday that in Finland they are celebrating. Mistakes. They have one day in the year where they are sharing all the mistakes they have been doing in the year, and just you know to collectively reflect upon them and they go to something else after that. So I think it's it's a one thing that is uh, shown as an example, but again, you know that's an interesting thing. Lian, would you like to uh, react to the this idea of using mentorship or mentoring to assess soft skills or to help assess? That's interesting. Yes. Um, so the mentoring program that we are developing at, um, at the World Planet Fellowship is not only on uh, science skills. Uh, we are looking at uh, science um, uh, scientists who are interested in uh, climate change and uh, what's happening in Africa and trying to find solutions. But the skill that they can develop is not, uh, it's not at all asked that it is a, a scientific or research project. It can be, um, it can be soft skills, it can be how to present better, how to, um, how to feel empowered, etc. And also I wanted to react on the, the question of the education and learning. I am not an education expert. I am not a teacher. I do not work at the university like my colleagues. Uh, but we never use education. I just realized that uh, when you ask the question, we always use empowering, um, strengthening skills, and capacity building. I don't know if these are wordings that we use at the university, but uh, weirdly, <laughs> I just realized we never use education. And uh, also regarding um, the, the learning outside of uh, the classroom, we have a component in the One Point Fellowship uh, um, for um, providing courses for climate change courses. Yeah. And um, the, the idea is uh, we are trying, we are uh, collaborating with AgroNatural, which is a network of uh, European universities. And we have decided that the modules that will be provided, uh, they will be provided by uh, African universities. And uh, we want to bring some field work within this module. And it is so expensive, like you said, <laughs> that we have to reduce by a lot the number of uh, researchers who will have the chance to go through this uh, training. That's a choice because we want Want to make a, a difference. We want uh, the module uh, to bring uh, other skills, soft or hard, but not just, like you said, um, uh, an accumulation of knowledge. Because the knowledge, they have it already, mm -hmm. or they can find it. And we have taken this decision, for example. Um, thank you. 
and this brings us also to the digital dimension of education or learning. We didn't touch upon it a lot, but that's something important. Lina Siki has a question that is one of our fellow, and it's interesting because she's also a physicist. So we have a lot of physicists in the room, and we should uh, look at that more closely. I think. Can you try to pick that? <laughs> okay, I will. I will repeat. I I think Answers to, to that point. So, um, sharing of best practices or how making sure that these uh, new uh, initiatives, these new uh, processes of challenge based learning can be shared uh, all over the world. And what about the cooperation uh, also with the countries in the south? Uh, Valérie, yes. you have yeah. this experience with the Marima project. Well, I, I have. A little experience the with the south, and I think that Jill could uh, add information about Europe. Uh, about the south, I totally agree when you said uh, it's not the north that is teaching to the south, it is together that we will work together. And if I use the example of Marima Project, which was a European one, the name of the project was Capacity Building in Higher Education. So you have to understand that people from the north, because we are from the north coordinating the project, we work with people from the south to take a tool we have here and to try to adapt to transform them so that it will be able to be implemented in the house. In fact, for me, it was not this. It was that working on me. I learned as much as they learned. We learned together because we were together. And so I will use a specific example. I have a teaching unit here in Montpellier about uh, what are the impact of global changes on the eco-hydro-socio system, OK? Uh, because I want my students to have this overview uh, of water, environmental, I'm talking about biodiversity in this, in this specific case, and society. And I want them to understand this. And I want them to be able to express a challenge. What is it a challenge? And to fill all the transdisciplinary dimension that it is related to physics. And I have one way to do it. And at the beginning, I had only 20 students in my classroom. I used games, role games, pictures on the ground, uh, pitch, uh, watching on um, YouTube, and so on. A lot of different tools 
uh, educational tools to be able to manage it. And this uh, teaching unit, the short one, uh, it was, I will say, well, uh, a success, a little success, but my students really like and learn a lot from here. And so the last time I did it, my there were there were not enough uh, chairs in the room, so I have students just here in the floor, you know. Yeah. So I had I had at this moment to say to wonder, but oh, will I oh will I be able to be the teacher of all these students? Because I have only fifteen hours paid by my university to do this. Oh, can be be possible for me to do it? And I had to find a solution to have something more massive. I will say one key, one, one key, one key was about uh, 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 collective thinking. I mean, I will use the example of the uh, climate fresco, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, is, what is very wonderful in this example is that each people, even if he has not the knowledge as a, I don't remember which one of you asked a, a question, talk about uh, even if I have not any knowledge about um, about this physical process, I have this little code. I will have some magic sentence, and I will be able to learn to all the other or to do. So this is um, the idea I have. I will ask you just to spend uh, half an hour on YouTube, and you on a paper, and you, but just an hour, uh, half an hour, but all together. When they will put all the knowledge to, together, we will have something and we will be able to build something, even if I'm not with, with uh, all this class. And I realized that my colleague in the South was very good at this. Uh, we are very good at this. Be why? Because, you know, I, I went to Cotonou in Vietnam and I visited the university. I was so surprised to realize how it is. It's not only a problem of money. It's a problem of, yes, buildings. Yes, I have. There is nothing inside. It's very difficult. And uh, so we are. De we decided last week, we decided to use this uh, teaching unit about uh, so impact of climate changes and global changes. Uh, and we will adapt it to be sure that it will be done in my classroom in Montpellier, in their classroom in Cotonou or in Abidjan and so on. And so we are taking all the, the sequences, well, each of the sequences of my teaching unit, and we are trying to improve, to modify. So we will be sure that we will be able to do it, even one teacher for a world um, um, fitter. Yeah, you know? So this is what we are doing, and I cannot do it alone. I can do it because they have this knowledge on how to learn to teach with a lot of people. So this was just an idea. Yeah. Thanks. Jenny, would you like to comment on that more, maybe on the European side and this uh, new innovative university bringing together five uh, campuses on one uh, digital campus uh, where all students are learning together? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I fully agree with, uh, with what uh, Valérie said. The, the key is uh, trying to share uh, the, the way the, the knowledge is, is given to be able to be more massive rather than taking care of a, a small a small group. But uh, challenge-based learning is, uh, is, uh, is a good way to, to mobilize naturally soft skills, because if you have a real challenge, it's, it's transdisciplinary by, by, by itself. So if you, if you implement in any curriculum, like uh, you are a physicist or a chemist or whatever, if you implement one real challenge in your curriculum, then naturally you will come with soft skills inside with a transdisciplinary approach, mobilizing other actors around the project. And that will learn, uh, will give a lot of new competencies to, to the students. What I want to say about uh, uh, soft skills is that uh, in Charming U, uh, we do not give any marks. So when you talk about how to evaluate, it's a holistic approach, so it's a programmatic, programmative assessment. There is no mark, only uh, competencies over a kind of spider map. And this is very, very difficult because not only the teacher should be trained, but also the student should be trained and trust in that because it's, more, it's much more subjective. So when you say you want to assess how you are communicating, it depends on the audience, it depends on the, on the one who will, will assess you. So this process 
is a process uh, which is driven by educationalists, which has already been studied in a research point of view, and we try to implement that, but I don't want to say that it's fantastic. I want to say it's very challenging, uh, and we are in progress of, of evaluating it, if it's better or worse for the student to do that. One of the key also is the empowerment of the student. And you mentioned that's very important. From the start, the student should be the, the main player of their education. And that, that, should, uh, that should be uh, uh, the, the way they, they, they will, they will uh, uh, realize they have to learn such that and that because they know it is, it is important for them. And to empower, empower the student, they have to, they have to be player of the education. They have to be able also to, to give feedback to the, to the, to the people who design the curriculum. And so in the, in the, this new uh, program, uh, the, the students are, are as, as a teacher are in, are also, um, uh, requested to, to make their feedback and to, to redesign the curriculum by, during, during the year, so it is very important. You mentioned about the, uh, the way of collaboration and, and the, the, we need a uh, structural uh, informatic system, communicating system to, to build uh, such an education. For example, in Charm, uh, we decided to have uh, the same lecture, the same teaching experience over five places at the same time. So the student can, travel whatever they want, whenever they want. They will have the same lecture at the same time. Now, how to achieve that? Uh, there is two pillars. The first one is technological. So we have hybrid classroom with a uh, uh, system like that where the student can, can communicate easily. And so the, the, there is one physical place where the, where the lecture takes place, but it's synchronously at the same time retransmitted and, and, and there is interaction through the screens. The second uh, point, very important point, is that that is not enough, and you should have inside uh, the, each location teaching assistants, which is a, 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 a position which doesn't exist in France anymore, unfortunately. So it, this is not exactly teacher, but as you say, teachers, people who can assist the student, the student organize debates, organize their activity, trying to help them to find resources to, to match with a researcher in, in, the, in, the, in their environment to, to ask questions. And we need that. And it takes, of course, a lot of time and resources. So uh, we come always back to the sustainability of the, such kind of education. But if we, if we uh, succeed in sharing uh, with the technology, we can share maybe more to other locations. If we can also imply the student, including PhD student, to the to the education as well, maybe we can share the burden of the hours and the and the, and the, and the lecture. Thank you, Gilles. And uh, Deborah, would you like to add a very quick last comment? Yes. Uh, thank you for the the questions about the soft skills and in the room in the panel and the assessment and auto evaluation and. Uh, there are some skills to evaluate soft skills in this position. And I think we, we, we teach that you know and that you are and you evaluate and auto evaluate better if you know oneself. If we know our cognitive basis, our need of acknowledgement. Soft skills, uh, they are capability of communication, uh, sharing, listening, opening mind. Empathy, humility, <laughs> accept error and mistakes, and the knowledge on myself. The Socrates know thyself. So skills are often due to the parental education, primary socialization. But when our students haven't got it, what do we do? But when we haven't got it, what do we do? And uh, we have. We have, it's, it's very, very important to teach it and train the, the teacher. And, and Gar Moran, uh, present the ecology of action to cope with the uncertainty, the complexity. I think we can suggest the ecology of oneself, the teaching to know thyself, 
cognitive basis, process of attention and passing, are trees resilient. The obstacles to create link, I think it's very, very important in education. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And thank you to all the panelists. I, I, I think we need to turn to the last part of our, of our uh, session today. I think we, we have online with us uh, Francois Cadey. Um, and before I introduce you, hi, Francois. Uh, I think I, I cannot summarize really what we have discussed because we cover plenty of topics. Uh, we saw that uh, there is a will um, to change the way education is practiced, uh, but there are also obstacles. And just to give some idea, uh, Francois, since you are joining, uh, we mentioned several innovative uh, pedagogical initiatives, such as uh, field schools. Uh, we mentioned that scientific issues actually are social issues and that you are learning by practice in the field. Uh, we did a bit of semantic. Uh, we wonder whether uh, the transformation should, shouldn't be on the wording side, if we should talk about education or not. Is it a one-way process or is it the right word to use? Should we talk about teachers or uh, team shares? Um, we had a call from uh, Paul Walsh, uh, actually, uh, to practitioners to take the lead, even if they are doing mistakes, so even if they are not knowing exactly what they are doing, but to take the lead. But we had also feedbacks uh, from colleagues here who are taking the lead, but uh, who actually mentioned that this was not only on their side, that uh, they, they were part of a system uh, led by governments with funding issues, and that doing that was not always uh, easy. Uh, we mentioned soft skills and how to evaluate them. So there are many questions I, I'm sure you can answer to answer. Uh, but before that, I would like to introduce you very quickly. I'm sure that people in the room uh, know who you are already, but just to give them some uh, insight. So you are the co-founder and president of the Learning Planet Institute, which is the new iteration of, of what was called uh, before Center for Research and interdisciplinarity that started in uh, 2006 in, in Paris. You've been trained uh, in a prestigious French uh, Grand Ecole, uh, Polytechnic <laughs> in Physics again. So we, are, we have a lot of physicists in the room. So that's funny to see that physicists are, are so mobilized on uh, transforming education. Uh, then you went to the NREF. Uh, uh, L'Ecole Nationale du uh, Génie Rural des Eaux et des Forêts. I, I won't translate that into English, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, it's about environment, uh, water, and forest. It was after the, the, the first uh, raid. Uh, and then you have, you have a PhD uh, in molecular and cellular genetics. So uh, this multidisciplinary training might uh, explain your appetite uh, for. Uh, blurring disciplinary uh, boundaries and addressing uh, complexity. So you, I, I may be wrong, but you, you may tell us more about that. You have received several distinctions, and I would like just to flag one. Um, you have been uh, a National Cat Fellow in uh, 2010, and this recognized uh, the status of a person as world-leading social entrepreneurs. So this is an interesting uh, distinction. And you have been commissioned uh, several times by the French government or international institution to write reports about research and education. And you are also the authors of uh, several books. And the last one in uh, this year uh, in French is called Estimou, Comment relever ensemble les défis du 21e siècle. So I would like to give you the floor uh, so that you can. Uh, close uh, this conference or open it to new perspectives and maybe uh, to start with uh, to make the connection with this new Learning Planet Institute, which is not uh, totally new. Um, 
you have made several times the case for revolution in education. And actually, you don't like the term education either. Uh, I think you prefer to use knowledge. And you also uh, advocated for the creation of learning societies that would be able to face uh, the major transition underway. So can you explain us exactly what you are uh, calling for and what is this learning planet in future? Um, okay, thanks for, for the invite. Sorry to have missed some of it. I, I could join at the end and, and got a few feedback, uh, such as the one you just gave. So thanks for to all of you. Um, for being here and, and being motivated by this question of transforming education for accelerating transition. I think, you know, we also have to accelerate transition of education uh, if we want to do uh, any of this. And I think we need a, a shift of paradigm uh, at the, not only university level, but also at the school level and at the lifelong learning level. And I think that the dominant uh, paradigm uh, in most places, especially in France, is where the students are not really at a say on what they want to learn and they are still uh, invited to compete with one another on topics that not only they have not chosen but are somewhat uh, narrowly defined uh, in a disciplinary way. Uh, I think that what we need to shift uh, towards is uh, we need to shift towards more cooperation, more disciplinarity, more challenge-based and more uh, students-based uh, program. And I think that that resonates probably with, with some of what you already do and, and, um, and uh, what you've already been discussing. But I think th this shift is, is not very easy because uh, basically universities do research on many topics, but very rarely on themselves and on their role uh, in these transitions. Uh, and I think that what we do know is that we are undergoing a sort of a global tragedy of the commons where you know our ability to compete with one another and to for led to another uh an, an abuse of the resources not only the natural resources but also the human resources and and even about ourselves because you know we are competing even as faculty for grants and for uh, all sorts of honors uh, our students are competing um and and that leads to a culture that uh, Michael Crow, who is the president of the University of Arizona State, um, say that for him, universities are part of the problem. They are not just part of the solution uh, to these transitions because of that culture of, of uh, you know, 19th century uh, disciplinary uh, cultures have had a huge impact on the way we've trained uh, the most of, of the elites of the world and, and if the elites are not taking the right decision it's partly because they've not been trained well so that's you know we're partly responsible for for the current state of the planet so that's um one perspective of michael crow uh it's complemented by uh, the Secretary general of the un that basically uh, recently uh received uh organized a transforming education summit um with UNESCO and, and many others, uh, including a lot of young people, 500 young, 500,000 young people have been invited to, to say what they wanted. And that led to a youth declaration, uh, for transforming education. And the first things they want is they want to be heard. Uh, and, and then they also want, you know, uh, digital tools. They want uh, to learn skills that are relevant. They want to, uh, understand the, the climate crisis. They want to understand the democratic crisis. They want to, uh, be active, uh, citizen and even what we can call planetism, meaning, you know, citizens that know to care for oneself, others and the planet. So that, that's, that's, uh, a, a big, um, dynamic that is uh, going on. Uh, throughout the world, as soon as you start having a meaningful conversation with the students on what they want to learn and how they want to find their own eco-anxiety. And the best way to fight eco-anxiety is not to deny the, the, the reality of the climate change, but to it's not just to change oneself, it's to join a community um, that can have an impact. And, and that's typically the sort of things that can happen in universities. So I believe that universities can become laboratories of the future because universities are places that are very special. They are concentrating uh, both high quality research in nearly all fields, uh, but also the use. And so there is no other institution that has this combination. 
Uh, some people, like the Scouts, for instance, have lots of young people, but they have no research. And, and some research institutions that don't have students, uh, including private uh, research institutions that are ever more powerful, uh, are, don't have that connection to the youth, so they, they are missing. Uh, this and and the third dimension is that universities have a local uh, footprint and and a local community that they can contribute to serve and and learning to serve the local community using the students engagement um, powered by the academic training and 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 research can be a game changer uh, at the very least locally and many universities have started to do this um, but if they are able to connect with one another, if they are able to share the best practices, if they are able to uh, mobilize uh, the students, uh, not only on one campus, but throughout the world, that can have uh, a the sort of systemic impact that we need to, uh, to have uh, given the emergencies that we're facing. So that's, that's uh, I think, some of the uh, the few things that I could be saying, and so you know, you asked me about the Learning Planet Institute. Um, so we changed name because interdisciplinarity. That was you know the reason we created this institute to train students to do interdisciplinary research is uh, is a mean, uh, not an end in itself. But you know, caring for the planet, uh, enabling the students to face their personal, uh, their local community challenges, and their and the global challenges that we all face, is something that we really want to shift towards. And um, and so this, you, you mentioned a few reports that I was invited to write. Um, a couple of them were uh, on the idea of uh, the idea of learning society, and and the UNESCO head uh, Audrey Azoulay uh, was interested to uh, scale this to the planetary level. We've launched with uh, UNESCO uh, the Learning Planets uh, Alliance. Uh, inviting hundreds of organizations, universities, social entrepreneurs, uh, local communities, and, and so on to contribute uh, to this movement and to celebrate the best way to learn, uh, the best way to mobilize collective intelligence, and the best way to have uh, impact that are meaningful. Um, and and so we are, you know, celebrating this, for instance, around January 24, which is the International Day of Education. So we organize a big learning kind of festival. You're all invited to celebrate this in your respective communities because that's last year we already had people from more than 160 countries participating. So we believe that you know this can be done at any scale. Everyone can can celebrate what they've learned uh, that is very meaningful and and what it is that they would want to learn. And maybe they can start learning it from their neighbors or from someone else in the in the local or global community. So that's typically the sort of things we are trying to do to uh, empower learners and mobilize collective intelligence at scale. Um, we are basically doing three sorts of things. So one is this building communities at scale. Uh, the other one is to uh, put emphasis on what we call the planetizing journey, which is inspired from the hero's journey of Joseph Campbell. Uh, that's, uh, for those that don't know, uh, is the basis of, of Star Wars and, and any uh, myths uh, either from today or from a uh, long time ago where every one of us, uh, when we face challenges, we have to overcome our own fears, we have to look for resources, we have to fight our inner uh, selves, uh, but also some of the obstacles that, that we uh, face. And we have to find peers, we have to find mentors, we have to find good examples, we have to find resources in order to move forward. And so how do we train uh, everyone to do this at every age is what we call the planetism and journey uh, and then we try to push for uh, planets and navigation tools so we've developed an actual intelligence uh, that is basically uh, an ai that has read all of wikipedia and that you know we plan to have to feed it with all the open education resource all the scientific articles all the uh, international reports on the state of the world uh, and that AI is doing what's called text to vec. So we transform all these texts into vectors. And so if a student uh, has a project, uh, we can say, what are the closest students' project next to this? What are the, the most interesting social entrepreneur work? What is the most interesting scientific work? What is the most interesting international reports on the issue that the students want to tackle? So the idea is that, you know, we cannot learn all of the complexity of the world at once, but the AI can you know, read a lot of it. And the AI does not understand anything, but can point us uh, um, to relevant resources that are the closest to what we are uh, aiming at. And so we, we plan to build what we call a sort of hybrid intelligence between 
the human intelligence and artificial intelligence between the individual and the collective um, to power or abilities to uh, navigate in the complexity of the world and become what we call planetism. So maybe I should define a little more these words, but the planetism is to the planet where the citizen is to the city uh, with a few differences because the first citizens were only the men in arms that were defending the city walls. There were no women citizen, there were no children citizen, there were no migrant citizen. Uh, and to this date, you know, uh, this is still uh, an exclusive notion. Uh, typically, children and migrants are not citizens. Uh, even to this date, even if women had to fight for long to, to get those rights. And uh, we believe that the city walls were also a separation between the humans in the city and the native outside. And so the, the, the citizen, uh, historically and geographically, is quite a narrow uh, concept. And so we hope that uh, offering to collectively define what planetizenship is, uh, inviting everyone to planetize under the planet's eyes, uh, inviting people to you know go into their own emotions uh, regarding their connection to the planet and, and to their um, uh, to the next generation is uh, something that we need to work on. So that's what we are trying to to weave in, and and so that's the way we can uh, hopefully uh, transform education to accelerate the transitions. Uh, to go back to uh, what you were saying, so I don't want to be too long. Maybe it's better to try to interact, even if doing it at a distance is is not the easiest uh, thing to do. That, that, thank you very much, Francois. Maybe just one word on transition. Since our topic today is on transforming education for accelerating transition, which is something we are really uh, at the heart of what we are trying to do at Nifty. Uh, what would look like for you a transition education, an education on transition, uh, with a view to accelerate this transition? And uh, how do you think that the learning plan at Institute and make it could uh, potentially collaborate on that? Difficult question. Uh, well, I think to collaborate, we have to spend more time together, and that will be fun. Uh, so you'd be welcome to visit anytime you want. Uh, so that's that's one dimension. Um, accelerating those transition is key for all the reasons that you all know. I think that again, universities can play a key role, and you know, places like Make It or the Learning Plan Institutes are relatively small compared to the entities to, that we uh, work in, like University of Montpellier, University of Paris Cité, and, and so on. But I think, you know, if we manage to be catalyst of the change, if we manage to offer changes of paradigm, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Donella Mido's work, not only on uh, the Limits to Growth uh, report that she uh, wrote uh, in the 70s, but more generally a vision of transitions and and paradigm shift and basically she says that the best way to accelerate transition is not to play on the parameters for instance it's not to play on the number of hours of students uh, uh learning discipline x or discipline y uh it's the the that's one dimension but it's certainly not the most effective one the second in ranking is uh that is not very efficient but a little better than the previous one is to have feedback loops so maybe, you know, uh, what are you uh, validating in the student's experience uh, would be a form of, of a feedback loop. You know, do you uh, validate their engagement? Do you uh, create uh, things like that? The third level is to modify uh, the rules of the game, maybe invite the students to redefine what the university is uh, and what a program is. Uh, certainly modify the information flow, you know, giving them access to the best uh, possible resources uh, would be a, an example of this. And then, you know, even more impactful if you want to uh, accelerate transitions for real is to change paradigms, uh, is to change, you know, what is it this for? You know, what are universities for? You know, what are what is learning for? What is education for? Uh, having opening these conversations and co-constructing solutions with the students, I think, would make a big difference. And then, you know, uh, proposing new paradigms um, is certainly uh, what's nearly our favorite solution. And then our, favorite, the, our very favorite solution is not just to propose an, one new paradigm, is to build what you call open paradigms, dynamical paradigms, where we are not necessarily fixed uh, to uh, the ancient to paradigm A to paradigm B, but you know we are more uh, evolutionist, uh, which is very good because uh, I did my PhD on, on evolution. So um, I'm, I'm very, um, I think what we can build is what I tend to call evolving fruitful frame of freedom. 
that have fractal dimensions. Okay, so evolving fractal fruitful frame of freedom. It's somewhat hard to to say in English, but um, you can um, build um, a place where there is frames. There is a frame because there is laws and, and walls and, and and money and and, and rules. But can you evolve that frame? Can you maximize the degrees of freedom that students get in that frame? Can you define what is fruitful? You know, is, is it fruitful just to get a diploma or is it fruitful to have a positive impact? Uh, is it fruitful to have a positive impact short term or long term? You know, those sorts of questions I think should be open. And so this evolving fruitful frame of freedom uh, should um, uh, take the time to evolve. And so you take the time for reflexivity. Deborah was talking about know thyself. You know, this know thyself as fractal dimension. You know, how do I know myself? How do I know what's happening in my cells, you know, within, uh, in my brain, in my emotions? But how do I know what's happening in my community? How do I know what's happening on the planetary level? So how do you have access to these uh, fractal frames of freedom? And how can you contribute to evolve them? Uh, I think would be somewhat interesting conversation, very much in line with what uh, Donel Amidos was uh, pioneering and advocating for, uh, and I think that's typically a sort of conversation that we could be having together uh, with the people in the panel or with you in, in Montpellier and and, uh, and with everyone that uh, wants to uh, contribute to that journey. And so that's typically what we do uh, within what we call the Learning Plant Alliance. We build circles. So we have one, for instance, on the transition of higher education. If you want to be associated with your pleasure uh, to involve you. We work also with uh, UNESCO, with UNICEF, with uh, United Nations University, and, and many other partners uh, throughout the world that you know have understood the, the need to accelerate those transitions. And and so, how can we learn from each other? Uh, and how can we do this with the diversity of solutions that uh, can come up across the planet, being very inclusive? You know, I heard North South uh, words before, but you know, uh, how can we really? Learn from uh, the best initiatives all, all around. Some of them, you know, come from Haiti. Some of them come from everywhere in the world. And we have to be uh, really aware of, of those uh, uh, that diversity and that quality. Thanks a lot, François, for this uh, insightful uh, comments and for sharing your experience at the Learning Planet Institute. And we will for sure uh, come to visit you since you have invited us. So we will come to, to discuss that further. I won't try to, to summarize anything. I would just retain from what you said, uh, Francois, that the, the university are the places actually where those transitions, some transitions uh, can happen. They are part of the problem, but they are also part of the solution. And I invite you all to embark on this planetism journey to uh, build a new paradigm. Uh, I think that will be the you think, and we can do that over lunch uh, because uh, sorry Deborah and sorry Francois, you won't be here, but we will have a nice lunch buffet now. But just before closing, I would like to give the final word to our three uh, wonderful PhD students that introduced this session. If you have a final word or final comment or, or final uh, ideas or wish that you would like to share with us, please, Aja, would you like? Yes, uh, I just want to uh, to uh, go back to uh, from where this talk started. It started from uh, a mail I got from the mailing list because I am from UMRGO, uh, Pira, uh, and I volunteered for that. Uh, I really thank uh, Mariana, Tora, and Patrick uh, because uh, when talking about education, as also Regine uh, insisted on bringing students to the spotlight is really important because it's where the magic happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think we should uh, duplicate a lot of these brain, uh, brainstorming uh, sessions because um, the debate uh, emerges from our diversity because if everything is ideal, everything everyone agrees with everyone, I think it's going to be really boring. But the fact that we are here in this uh, session I think we did also brainstorm on other stuff uh, with the PhD students, researchers, uh, panelists from different uh, profiles and backgrounds. It's really important, and I think it's going to, uh, uh, and I think we are moving forward. And I would like to uh, really thank Make It for uh, the uh, things they are doing because it's my second experience with Make It. Actually, in, uh, in last June, I participated in a workshop 
uh, were a visit in a uh, fellow or researcher from Make It, uh, like organized a seminar, and they gave the chance to PhD students to talk about their thesis in another uh, uh, in another way. And uh, I participated in that and presented my thesis. And after that, it, it was a lot of networking, a lot of exchanges, and uh, I think it's uh, it uh, gave me uh, self confidence. And I'm sure I will try and do my best to uh, replicate that. I was very surprised. So I was just about to say that I was happy to participate in the session and be a part of this discussion uh, today. And yes, young people want to be home. That's my message. Thank you. Um, and I would be short as well because I want to speak. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but first, I just want to thank all of the people for the organization for the brainstorm and for the participation and everyone who to participate in this uh, session. And I'm just hoping that uh, this discussion and reflection will stop after the buffet and that we can continue to work together. Uh, I would really like to like to think on this topic, and I would like to implement uh, our idea on the campus, especially for PhD students and the, the formation of the So yeah, I will. Uh, I hope that we will uh, keep uh, working together. Again, the three of you, and we can. I think the first step will be to send your contribution to the blog post Paul mentioned uh, on the SDG Academy. That would be already a, a good first step. And thank you very much uh, to the four now of you and Paul who, who has to leave. And thank you very much, Francois, uh, for closing very nicely uh, this uh, this uh, morning session. Thanks to all of you, and uh, I invite you to join the buffet. Merci Francois, merci beaucoup. Au revoir, à bientôt. Au revoir, Deborah. Au revoir, bon appétit.